she may stop even coming to school because what is the teacher doing? She's hurting their identity. So this whole process of labeling some groups as possessing a language, other groups as possessing a dialect is great harm done. And also by not offering mother tongue medium maintenance oriented education to indigenous and minority children is also not at all good for society because actually languages will die and with that a culture will die, a narrative will die, a story will die with it. So we come up with solutions and uh, one is multilingualism and translanguaging. So from 1986 our education policy, the Indian education policy has emphasized the significance of integrating children's languages into formal education. 2005 NCF also recognized the pluralities and the great need to integrate school knowledge with the social, economic and the ethnic milieu of children. So the language was seen of the child, the language of the child was seen as the axiom around which the child's world was constructed. So India has paid a lot of attention to languages and multilingualism and which is a very good thing. As Garcia says, in multilingual societies like India, children bring with them a number of ways of languaging when they come to school. And the NCF 2005 has provided the space when it says that language teaching needs to be multilingual, not only in terms of the number of languages offered to children, but also in terms of evolving strategies that would use the multilingual classroom as a resource. So very important point, how to use the multilingual classroom as a resource. But there is no reference to the hybrid linguistic structures and fluid language practices in the curriculum. So what is happening is, the goal is like, okay, we have the first language, then we have the second language and the third and fourth, and we expect a mono-like, a monolingual-like proficiency for each of these languages, which is not authentic and also not feasible given the multiplicity of languaging practices that are prevalent in the Indian context. So actually, our pedagogical uh, stances that we do not allow hybrid structures that are part of our day-to-day -day conversations. So schools do not allow hybrid structures. And so while our education policy claims that it is all about multilingualism, it is actually tacitly promoting a form of monolingual multilingualism. And Mohanty actually calls it nominal form of multilingual education and claims that India is only superficially multilingual but it is monolingual at an underlying level because again as I men mentioned earlier that the fluid and dynamic practices which are so wonderful and beautiful that typically characterize the nature of multilingual speakers linguistic repertoire within the Indian context find no resonance in the classroom. So the teachers, what do they do? They put a garb of monolingual speaker or educator. And because they want to give maximum ex exposure to students in the target language. So such a method neglects, in a sense, the languages, the multilingual resource that the children have. So the Indian classrooms, in a sense, are guided by these monolingual ideologies and we need to get away from this thinking. So what happens is we should probably understand what is translanguaging and how to use it in the classroom. Translanguaging refers to the act of using linguistic resources in fluid and dynamic ways such as the, that the boundaries that are drawn between languages like Hindi and English are blurred you know. And uh, scholars who discuss translanguaging argue that this notion of one language plus another language equal to two languages is reductive and inadequate in explaining.
explaining multilingual situations. And there's a suggestion that code mixing and translating, which are normally done, should be allowed. So even in the Indian classroom, we should focus probably on the dynamic and fluid nature of the competencies that are employed by multilinguals in communicative contexts. This will give such a richness to even the classroom, which does not mean that the target language will not be taught, but it can be taught in a much more humane and uh, uh, multilingual way. So we should not have this paradox of an overt commitment to multilingual goals, but covert association with monolingual ideology. So in fact, whatever the teacher may do, the, these trans uh, languaging practices do enter classrooms. Because teachers who will uh, prevent the students from uh, engaging in code switching and uh, code mixing will use translanguaging uh, trans practices. Because when they have to explain a concept to the students, they have to use the mother tongue, they have to use uh, the regional language, they have to use other languages. So some forms of translanguaging anyway enter classrooms. But it would be better if it is used without any, uh, any thought of why are we doing it? Are we doing the right thing? Are we not doing the right thing? So if it is used naturally, it would, be, it would enrich the child, it would make the child feel better and, it, and probably language acquisition would be much more robust. Then we come to solution two. And here again, let us try and minimize the power relation and bring a sort of critical pedagogy into the ELT or into any classroom. I've mentioned an ELT classroom, but it can be any language classroom. It can be any classroom itself. Critical pedagogy primarily is an approach to language teaching and learning, which looks at the classroom essentially as part of the wider social context and is based on the argument that discrimination and marginalization that is pre prevalent in social systems will be reflected in the educational system as well and it will reproduce the same biases. And what it does is it seeks to empower learners to make them think and act critically so that they can transform their lives. Because here also remember that the ideas and values of the powerful get accepted and these are promoted at the cost of others whose voices are not powerful. Critical pedagogy seeks to transform the relations of power which are obviously oppressive and it is based on the idea of a just society in which people do not suffer from any kind of discrimination and marginalization and have full control of their lives. So what is the role of the learner in critical pedagogy? So as we know, learner comes to the class with enormous linguistic and cognitive potential. But remember, some of this knowledge and experience is problematic. It could be sexist, it, it could be casteist. So what is the teacher's role? So the teacher's role also is to do with classroom management, classroom transaction, and the physical structure. So instead of a teacher front classroom, it should be all about pair work and group work. It should be about encouraging learners to respond first. It is about giving them confidence making sure that nothing that they say is trivial and intervening only when it is necessary. So the teacher is not this all-powerful alien, but is actually a learner amongst learners. So let us talk about the difference between mainstream versus critical pedagogy. So in mainstream pedagogy, learning is a detached cognitive activity. But in critical pedagogy, learning is a personal thing. It's something unique to a child. So it's not something detached, but something unique to the child. In the mainstream, 
Learning involves the mind in analysis, comprehension and interpretation. There is no place for emotion, imagination, emotion, intuition, because this could distort objectivity. But critical pedagogy is quite different. Learning is personal. The personal cannot be detached from the learning process. One is consciously part of one's influences, of one's consequences, of one's implications. So, and all this is part of the learning process. In the mainstream, again, learning is about impartiality and neutrality. But in critical pedagogy, learning is located in the environment and conditioned by the influences of his or her context. So, the context becomes very important. The personal becomes very important in critical pedagogy. Then, the learning processes in mainstream are universal. Knowledge is value free. In critical pedagogy, the knowledge that people produce or acquire is grounded in their social practice and material context. And everything is value little. Everything is ideological. And the learner must be encouraged to question the hidden assumption and values that come with knowledge. And so I will end here uh, with just summing up, which is that we talked about language and power. We talked about how people have access to power and how language and dialect and standardization are all processes of this power game. And then we talked about two solutions. One was translanguaging and multilingualism. And the second was critical pedagogy. So thank you very much. In the current global economy and the digital era, learn or perish is the order of the day for all adults in all sectors of life. As a result, adult education and lifelong learning have assumed great significance. IGNU as a national university has played its role by way of coming up with the Master of Arts in Adult Education program, MAAE. MAAE program focuses on different aspects of theory and practice, policies and programs, as well as research among other things related to adult education. MAE is a two-year modular program with multiple entry and exit options. Students who complete first year of the program will be awarded with the postgraduate diploma in adult education. In case they want to continue, they will complete the second year program and they will be awarded with the Master of Arts in adult education. MAE program consists of 10 courses. Five courses in each year, eight theory courses, six credits worth, and one practical course of 10 credits in the first year, and one dissertation course of 10 credits in the second year. Practical course of MAAE is divided into three components, namely community-based practical activities, workshop based practical activities and adult education training center or institution based practical activities and the student has to complete all the three components for completion of this practical course. The minimum qualification required for admission to this program is bachelor's degree from any recognized university. The minimum duration is two years and the maximum duration is four years. Instructional system follows multimedia approach. The major medium of instruction is self-learning print materials, which is supplemented by other media, such as audio-video programs, broadcasting, that is interactive radio counseling, teleconferencing, personal contact programs or counseling sessions at the study centers, workshops and field work, as well as internship at the institutional level. Those who seek out 
a master's degree in adult education have a myriad of career and specialization options they can go further for higher studies that is research in various fields of adult education and adult literacy teacher faculty in university departments of adult and continuing education extension and lifelong learning field functionaries in the projects implemented by state and central governments as well as ngos for more details you can log on to www.ignou.ac.in don't forget to take admission hurry up welcome viewers welcome viewers uh, to the teleconferencing session uh, i am dr kakuli gogoi along with me is professor minal mishra and uh, professor r vaskar uh, we are from geology discipline school of sciences igno viewers today we are going to discuss about uh, a very interesting and important topic Uh, the name of the topic is extinction so uh, let me tell you that this session would be uh, very useful for the learners of uh, bsc uh, geology uh, cvcs uh, course that is bgyct 137 uh, stratigraphy and paleontology so viewers uh, as we all know that the age of the earth is uh, you see 4.5 billion years and we humans entered uh, uh, into the earth uh, uh, you see uh, about 3 uh, lakhs uh, years ago uh, that means uh, for your better understanding if uh, we assume the age of the earth uh, to be uh, 24 hours then the humans entered into the earth uh, uh, not uh, Uh, uh this uh, less than uh, half a minute uh, like uh, you see uh, uh, 11 hours and uh, 59 minute and 40 second pm that means uh, what does this means this means that uh, there are also uh, many extinctions happen before humans enter uh, the earth so uh, if i talk about the famous fl- uh, flame Uh, that we all know that the jurassic park where you have uh, seen that uh, dinosaurs uh, extinct and uh, before their extinction uh, they lived um, on this earth for more than 165 million years so uh, like uh, this extinction there are also many uh, famous extinctions and we will be talking about uh, such extinctions uh, like the permian extinction uh, the ordovician silurian extinction the uh, cretaceous and uh, tertiary extinction then triassic jurassic extinction uh, devonian extinction and also we will uh, talk about the sixth extinction that is uh, the most important extinction that is orthopocene extinction so let us begin uh, with uh, uh, and understand what is extinction so extinction means the death 
uh, of a taxon. And in a broader sense, uh, the extinction includes the effects of its uh, disappearance from the environment in which it has uh, interacted. So, a species is extinct uh, when the last individual of that species disappears. So, uh, the death of the last individual of the last species of that genus and so on the uh, and it follows and the extinction of the genus. So, uh, you see this extinction, this is most common of all the ecological and all the evolutionary processes. So, there are uh, many sources from where uh, we can uh, get information of this extinctions like we can get information from lab experiments, we can get information from uh, field studies and most importantly from the uh, fossil records. And uh, uh, you see uh, this extinction, uh, this is the common feature of life on the earth and when viewed over along uh, this geological time scales. And you will be surprised to know that about almost 99% uh, of all the species that uh, have uh, lived, they have gone uh, extinct. So, uh, let us understand what do we mean by the word extinct. So, we can say uh, that a species is extinct uh, when no members of the species exist anywhere on the earth. And the species is extinct in the wild uh, if it exists only alive in uh, captivity. So, uh, if a species is no longer alive in its habitat but still exists in other areas, then we consider it as locally extinct. So, a species is ecologically extinct if it uh, persists in very few members uh, so that it uh, effects on other species are negligible. So, uh, let us talk about uh, pseudo extinction. Pseudo extinction is this is nothing but it occurs when all the members of the species are extinct but the member of the daughter species are alive. So, this extinction evolve into a uh, new form and they may change its taxonomic name. So, because of this continuous evolution, uh, the latter forms uh, uh, may look uh, significantly different from the earlier ones. So, despite uh, a continuing breeding uh, lineage, this ancestral uh, species die out. For example, uh, the Lazarus, uh, this taxa, they are the linkages that disappeared but they uh, uh, returned. So, there are also many vulnerability uh, to this extinctions. So, the categories that are most frequently used in uh, conservation uh, planning are, so the species with a narrow uh, geographical range or the species with a single or few populations, then species with uh, small population size and species in which uh, this population size is declining and also species uh, that are hunted or harvested by people. So, viewers, uh, 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 I have just discussed about uh, what is extinction uh, and the, the vulnerability to this extinction. So, there are also some causes to this extinction. Uh, Father Professor Vaskar will discuss about these causes of extinction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kakoli, and uh, you have rightly explained uh, the causes of uh, extinction, the uh, introduction to ex extinction, and learners must be happy to know how Dr. Kakoli correlated the uh, Earth's time period to extinction. And in a simple way, she explained how 24 hours, if you take, humans entered very late, and despite uh, our late entry, that means extinction which occurs is a process of natural selection. It's a natural, even if there is no human interference, it will occur. But what is the concern now is that because of human mediated uh, uh, activities, what has happened is the extinction events have increased somewhere 1000 to 10,000 fold. 
and that is what is the cause of concern. If you see the IUCN report, then you can see 31% of the known amphibians, around 12% of the known birds, and 20% of the known uh, mammalians are listed as threatened. So you can see that these are the natural causes. Now, what are the, uh, uh, if we divide the cause, there are natural causes and human causes. Now, natural causes and human causes, one is human causes, you can think of over-exploitation, you can think of pollution, you can think of loss of habitat. And what are the natural causes? They can be several. For example, there can be spread of invasive species, there can be climate change, there can be disasters, there can be uh, extermination, there can be introduction of inv invasive species, there can be loss of food source, and there can be ecosystem imbalance. So these are the causes. I will discuss one by one with each of this. The first one I would like to discuss is the climate change. Now climate change is very important. As you are seeing even current day, we are, uh, if you see all the reports, it is the number one problem which is occupying the minds of all the world leaders. And whatever changes you are seeing, including the floods and uh, uh, droughts and all other unusual weather phenomena are related to climate change. Even in the past, even though human interference was not there, the climate has been uh, changing. And these changes, whenever they occurred, this lot of species got extinct. So we should not ignore climate change and the current limit what our uh, agreement, international agreement is 1.5 degree to 2 degree centigrade we can go. More than that, already we are seeing witnessing, we will have serious consequence. You will also be surprised when the earth was formed, it was a reducing environment, there was no oxygen. And when cyanobacteria created this oxygen, uh, for many of the organisms that time, because there was a change of atmosphere, the oxygen was a pollutant. And you know, a lot of organisms died. And when it was reducing environment, the anaerobes were dominant. When it became oxidizing, the aerob aerobic organism became dominant. So change the atmosphere and the species changes and lot of extinction takes place. Now even in the geological history past somewhere in the Permian period, we had lot of methane gas emissions. And methane gas is uh, several times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And you know, this heating up, you know, resulted in wiping out of lot of species. Again, uh, today what we are concerned is the fossil fuel usage which is carbon dioxide. So you can see climate change is very important. Here, uh, learners, you should understand whenever something happens in one of the spheres, uh, everything is related, atmosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, and hydrosphere. They are all interconnected, interdependent, and interrelated. Now, the second uh, aspect of the natural one is the disaster. Whenever any disaster occurs, again, a lot of species get extinct. And if you see the volcanic eruptions, they can release a lot of gases, they can change the atmospheric chemistry, and a lot of uh, uh, life can be lost. Similarly, in the past, uh, uh, you will have the discussion in future, uh, uh, pro this program itself, how uh, the meteoritic impact wiped away the dinosaurs. So there is also a hypothesis that the cosmic uh, radiation contains, uh, can cause gene mutation and uh, these kind of things are going on. So disasters can be one cause, or natural cause. Then the third one is loss of food supply. If there is no food supply, then of course uh, the organisms will become weakened and they will die and they will be vulnerable to predations and uh, also diseases. What are the causes for loss of food uh, supply? There can be fires. For example, forest fires can occur even naturally. And these kind of forest fires can cause these losses. Now, disease is another natural factor. You have seen how corona has affected us. If there is a microorganism which is spreading, and for example, any disease by fungi, virus, or bacteria, this can wipe away entire populations if they are not uh, able to cope up. And these kind of changes are also related to climate change. So diseases can occur. Then invasive species is another important natural cause. Sometimes uh, some species is planted in some uh, area or it comes naturally also invasive species and they can steal natural resources and they can kill the uh, natural species. For example, island extinction, this uh, biodiversity occurs due to these phenomena. Again, predators, parasites and pests also are responsible for these kind of uh, events. Now, extermination. 
if accidentally we release some uh, plant, uh, plant or organism, that also can uh, disturb the uh, local ecosystem and wipe away the organisms. For example, uh, humans when they entered, they must have been responsible for uh, slaining or uh, extermination of North American mastodons. Again, if you see humans, they have been responsible for a large number of extinction of birds, mammals, fish and vegetation. Now, ecosystem imbalance. This is very important. All species are interdependent, interrelated, and interconnected. You, it is like a pack of cards. If you remove one card then uh, from the pack, then the entire pack will collapse. For example, nowadays we are hunting for the shark fins. And when we hunt for the shark fins, what will happen? One from the food chain, from the uh, one part of the uh, complete is taken out. And the whole food chain can collapse. It can lead to uh, extinction. These are also ecosystem balance is very important. Then human causes, of course, they are the primary what we are seeing now. Humans are playing the maximum role we have accelerated the rate of extinction and uh, if humans are accelerating how they are doing it for example breakdown of pollination is there or seed dispersion is there food chain is uh, disturbed all these things are occurred and if un uninterrupted stressed populations can deteriorate and become endangered now, overexploitation is another natural cause, uh, another cause which is there. For example, you can have unsustainable hunting and gathering. All these things can, you know, uh, cause in depletion of these uh, biological resources and threaten them. For example, we are uh, go, uh, hunting for ivory, tiger fur, organs, tunas, delicious, uh, delicious uh, parts, shark fin, all these kind of things can result in uh, overhunting and disturbing the ecological balance. For example, dodo, which was there, again was exter exterminated by human intervention. Then pollution is again a important aspect that when you pollute something, again, you know, uh, for example, I will give example of DDT. When it was introduced, we thought it is very good for agriculture. But what has happened is that because of biomagnification and uh, bioaccumulation, this has gone to different uh, levels of organism. And the uh, eggs which were laid by the birds, you know, the shells were weak. And these birds also endangered the uh, bald eagle. So uh, in the uh, 1960s, this problem was seen. So you can see how humans are... Uh, changing this. Again, acid deposition can result in, uh, again, loss of biodiversity. For example, our factories emit SOx and NOx, and when rain falls, uh, uh, nitric acid or sulfuric acid or even uh, any other uh, mild acid, that also causes all these kind of changes. Now, loss of habitat. The human population is increasing, and when population is increasing, we, uh, you know, destroy their habitat, we encroach upon their habitat, and if deforestation continues, we will lose rainforest. And humans have destroyed 27% of the coral reefs that house 25% of the marine animals. If you see elephants, buffalo, and predator cats cannot adopt to reduce territory, while other species can shift to many areas and others can die. Then there is a difference between background uh, extinction and mass extinction. Background extinction, as Dr. Kakoli rightly explained, occurs in the background. It occurs very slowly. It occurs without any external influence. Whereas if you see mass extinction, it occurs very rapidly and it can be due to natural causes and uh, this can occur over wide geographical areas. Now you can see the uh, criteria for mass uh, extinction. There are essentially four criteria for mass extinction. If you see extinction occurs all over the world, that is the first one. It has to have wide geographical implication. A great number of species has to go extinct and different and many types of species go extinct and these extinctions have occurred in a very short geological intervals. These are the criteria for mass extinction. As I said, the difference between mass extinction and background extinction is already explained. Background extinction is a continuous process whereas mass extinction occurs because of uh, rapid environmental changes. Now there is a process which is called speciation. 
what is the speciation in which the population developed into different species. Now, uh, you may think extinction is uh, destroying biodiversity, but in a way, what happens when extinction occurs, there is uh, less uh, competition for food and resources, and the organisms which are less uh, dominant, they occupy the niche and uh, speciation took, uh, takes place. For example, mass extinctions can spur speciation, and this is uh, proven. Now, uh, there are five major extinctions which have occurred, and I would request uh, Professor Minal Mishra to share her thoughts on the five major geological extinctions. Thank you, Professor Baskar. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. Karkoli Gogoi and Professor Baskar, have very nicely explained about what is extinction, what are the causes of extinction, what is background extinction. Now, it arouses curiosity in us what were the five mass extinctions? So mass extinction or extinction word, let me tell you, in Hindi, we call it vilupti. Like, uh, uh, like uh, the species, they are completely finished off at that period. So there were five natural mass extinction and it is a very mysterious phenomena. And uh, the scientists believe that uh, it was a tro that that was a traumatic event that caused mass extinction in the ancient past or in the geological past. And based on uh, field uh, uh, investigation, lab work, they have identified mass extinction by tracking lifespans of species through the fossil record. So uh, the mass extinction, it comprised of multiple occurrences that happened in the short time and uh, that uh, resulting in complete devastation. So there, apart from these five major mass extinctions, there were minor ones also. But uh, let us talk about the major extinction. First, we start with Permian extinction. See, uh, otherwise, if you see in the geological time scale, you have Ordovish, uh, Devonian, Ordovician, Silurian, and then Permian. But here we are talking about these extinctions based on the severity of extinction. That means the extinction that was most devastating was Permian extinction. And that happened about 250 million years ago when, you know, 90% of the species were wiped out from the earth. And this 90% it included... 95% marine species, including trilobites, and 70% of the land species uh, that included plants and insects and vertebrate. So, you know, it, it was most devastating. And, and as Professor Basker told you, that the methane, it uh, spiked up during this Permian. They say, they say that it was due to the spike of the methane that resulted in such a devastating uh, extinction. Next. Next we come to Ordovician Silurian extinction. This, uh, this uh, was less severe than the previous one. The previous uh, Permian extinction was more devastating. So this Ordovician Silurian extinction, this happened approx approximately 443.5 million years ago and you know it wiped around 25% of the marine families and 85% of the marine species. So you can just guess uh, how much of the species got extinct. So after this Ordovician Silurian, yes, Ordovician Silurian extinction, they say that uh, climate change was the cause for this extinction and it was uh, like the earth was covered with snow. It was all cold climate, glaciated climate. So other species got extinct. The less severe in the next in the series is Cretaceous tertiary extinction or KT extinction. And you know it is the most talked after extinction. It is uh, very interesting. You must have um, uh, seen those uh, movies on uh, tri uh, this uh, Jurassic Park when uh, you see those dinosaurs on your TV screens or, uh, or in a movie, uh, that was that time uh, when the species got extinct. So this KT boundary, that means Cretaceous tertiary boundary, or it is also known as Cretaceous Paleogene, 
uh, extinction event. You know, it wiped out around 80% of the animal species, which included dinosaurs, that, that happened around 66 million years ago. Apart from dinosaurs, there were uh, other species also, like uh, 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 ammonites. And you know, this huge ammonite uh, 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 ammonites, they were present at that time in the sea. And uh, the dinosaurs were present on the land. And, you know, dinosaurs were very bulky and huge animals. And these am ammonites also got very uh, big size. So it was very difficult for them to move around and for dinosaurs. And one thing more I just want to tell here, that at that time there are two theories. Either there was a volcanic event because India was moving, India was taking its north, northern flight and India came over the reunion hotspot and this, uh, these states of Maharashtra, Gujarat, they are all covered the, with these volcanic rocks that is of Cretaceous period. So it is said because of this huge volcanic event, lot of poisonous gases were uh, emanated in the atmosphere. The atmosphere got poisonous and these animals couldn't breathe and it was a lot of upheaval also took place. So dinosaurs could not move from one place to other because you know dinosaurs were herbivorous. So that was also one of the cause of this extinction and another theory which says that there was a meteoritic impact. We have evidences of meteoritic impact in Arabian Sea. At that time, a huge meteoroid, it hit the earth and this, uh, these are the two theories which have been propagated. Now, next we come to the extinction that is end Triassic extinction. So after Cretaceous, this end Triassic extinction that is an event that is also known as TJME and it marks the boundary between Triassic and Jurassic period that is 201.4 million years and uh, by the end of uh, Triassic uh, again there, there was a big climatic uh, shift uh, and uh, it was because of the climatic change. Another theory says there was an astro uh, asteroid impact. And you know, 70% of the species, they got extinct. And about, uh, from these 70%, 20% are the marine species which got extinct. So this, this entire event that occurred in the span of 10,000 million years, so uh, that was not as devastating as it was in the Permian time, but yes, it was. And um, after this Triassic extinction, the another extinction, which is known as Devonian, ex Devonian extinction. So this Devonian extinction, it um, happened at 407.6 million years to around 358 million years. And you know, 70 to 80% of the species were wiped out and uh, 15 to 20% uh, 15 to species uh, uh, from the, uh, 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 I mean, uh, all these uh, species from uh, this brachiopod group, they got wiped out. So it was also one of the devastating, but not as the Permian one. And the last extinction, that is the sixth extinction. See, all these five extinctions are natural. It is because we have uh, their uh, records present in our fossil record, in our rocks, uh, we have their records present. But the sixth extinction, which we humans are witnessing, and because of the human activity, because of the anthropogenic activity, this is being accelerated. Therefore, this sixth extinction is also known as anthropogene extinction or age of man extinction. It is caused by human. And um, this mass extinction is also known as Holocene extinction. This is a, is, is a period in which human came and it has been accelerated uh, every day, you can say. So uh, just, uh, just I, uh, Professor Baskar has also already told you, I just want to um, list some factors which caused this extinction. That was overhunting, that was lost of, loss of their habitat and many other uh, causes that have already been discussed by Professor Baskar. 
I just want to tell you about the uh, ex uh, this uh, species dodo that go that got extinct because of the loss of their habitat. You can see on your screens this uh, uh, dodo is uh, seen. Uh, so. Uh, Still, it is predicted that this uh, sixth extinction will be more devastating because as and as the, uh, our progress is proceeding, or you can say our technosphere is uh, expanding, we are witnessing more extinctions. So the previous extinctions were caused because of uh, the natural factors like volcanic activity, asteroid uh, hit, and the, uh, volcanic activity. But... Uh, this uh, sixth extinction is caused because of the human activity. I will request uh, my colleague, because uh, we are running short of time, I would request my colleague Dr. Kakuli Gogoi to please sum up whatever we have discussed. Yes, uh, viewers, today we have discussed uh, uh, this uh, interesting topic and uh, we have discussed about uh, what is extinction, we have discussed about the vulnerability to extinction, we have also discussed about the major five extinctions and also the important sixth ex extinction that is the Orth um, Anthropocene extinction. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, we end this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you wish to be part of a television studio like this or any other media system or already part of any media system want to enhance a new set of skills? Welcome to School of Journalism and New Media Studies. Here in the School of Journalism and New Media Studies, we are offering program for all set of people to learn and enhance their media skills. The vision of School of Journalism and New Media Studies is to generate a new set of professionals in the area of media and communication studies with understanding about role of media in the national development and global understanding. We offer innovative programs in the field of journalism and mass communication that sets a benchmark of high quality learning and teaching process at the national level. We offer these programs across the country with the help of our regional network as well as study center. Same manner, many of our programs are offered through online mode with a sophisticated learning management system. SOGNMS offers programs from PhD in journalism and mass communication till certificate level. We have masters in journalism and mass communication. The eligibility is bachelor's degree. And we are introducing this program in three languages, Hindi, Tamil, and English. Students from national and international students can join either through online mode as well as in the distance mode. We have four postgraduate diploma programs, specialized areas in the field of development communication, digital media, electronic media, and journalism and mass communication program. And all these four programs are available in distance mode. Two programs are available in online mode, development communication, and digital media. And we have specialized certificate program in community radio. IGNO employs various media and communication tools for better teaching and learning process. School of Journalism and New Media Studies utilizes this media system for delivering all our programs. Come and join with us for exploring a new career and enhance your media skills.
Hello, Namaskar and a very warm welcome to all the viewers who are watching us live in today's teleconferencing session. I am Dr. Gitika S. Jhori and along with me in the studio, I have my colleague Dr. Rachna Agarwal, Associate Professor. We both are coordinating the BA Vocational Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise Program being offered by the School of Vocational Education and Training. Our today's topic is an introduction to the BAV MSME program and uh, I'd now request my colleague Dr. Rachna to take the session forward by giving an overview of the Bachelors of uh, Vocational Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Geetika Jauri, and a very warm welcome to all the viewers of Yandarshan Ignu channel and uh, aspiring candidates for BAV MSME program, which we are going to talk about today. So uh, before I begin this uh, session, which is about this program and introduction to the program, I would like to sensitize our viewers about the uh, need for this program. Why do we need uh, bachelors in MSME program? So uh, in, in, if you would uh, give me an opportunity to just uh, take you to a brief introduction about the scenario of the country today. As we know that there are, there is the maximum labor force available in our country, which is amounting to more than 500 million people. Yet, if you see, there are th about 300 million people who are still living below the poverty line. And 31 million people are currently jobless in India. So you can imagine the scenario that from where we can create so many jobs which can cater to this large chunk of population. Also, it has been seen recently that there has been a continuous fluctuation in the job market. And post pandemic, we have seen that the requirements for entering into the job world has dramatically changed. The requirements which were earlier, which was demanding our sitting in the offices for long hours now has suddenly become online. Everything is happening online in a virtual mode. So what is the need of the R? If I have to explain in one line, it is to have your own startups. Can we create so many jobs? Can we create so many industries which can cater to just this large chunk of workforce which we have in our country? To cater to this, the need is to have a, a, our own startup so that one can employ not only oneself, but can also employ other people and help in creating jobs for other people in the country who are not getting any opportunity to work, who want to work, but they are not getting any opportunity. So need of the R is to be a social entrepreneur. Social entrepreneur rather than a business entrepreneur. So what is the difference? When we say social entrepreneur, we mean it, he has to take care of the societal needs. When we have, we know what is a business entrepreneur. Business entrepreneur is one who is uh, doing the business to earn profits, yeah. right? But a social entrepreneur is also doing the business to earn profits with the societal needs, with recognizing the Requirement of the society, requirement of the labor force which we have in our country. So social entrepreneurs, they include societal benefits along with the profits. And they fulfill the requirements that are unmet by the market. They work for and not against the societal interests or benefits. So entrepreneurship improves one's standard of living, income generation and also it helps you to innovate to venture into new startups have new ideas to float new opportunities to the existing um, availability in the society now entrepreneurship skills are very important and an in and an individual should know how to apply these innovative techniques in the business so even if you see our new education policy, which is NEP 2020, Government of India is focusing on skill-based education with the ability to create 
new startups and provide jobs to others so this is not only the need of the hour it is also promoted by the government of india by means of nep that is new education policy 2020 and all the educational institutions they are all trying to come up and build their course structure so that they have the maximum skill component in their programs and that can attract more youngsters more youth population so that they don't only get the theoretical knowledge they get skills hands on training so that they can be employable and they can start their own work it is not that after doing a graduation you start looking for a government job no after doing a graduation especially in our program like ba msme you should be you should have that much of capability and confidence that you can have your own startup so that is the whole idea now if i have to introduce what is msme msme as we know is it stands for micro small and medium enterprises now in accordance with the msme that is medium micro small and medium enterprises development act of 2006 the enterprises are actually classified into two categories one is the manufacturing enterprise and the other is the service sector or the service enterprise now what is a manufacturing enterprise a manufacturing as the name suggests it it is about engaging or manufacturing products or production in a uh, industry say of various uh, goods of commodities which we require on a day to day basis and what is a service enterprise a service enterprise is about catering to the various services like hotel industry restaurants or any other service sectors say uh, airlines and the staff which is involved these are all service sectors so there are two aspects or two divisions in the enterprises one is the manufacturing and the other is the service sector so if we have to say what are the uh, important features of msmes msmes as we now know they are the micro small and medium enterprises and i will now i will also explain what each one uh, denotes how it is categorized into different categories on what basis first let us see what are the essential features of msmes now msmes are known to provide assistance for businesses large businesses like for both domestic as well as export market for example there is a business uh, say of automobiles or car manufacturing industry and uh, uh, to supply some of the parts say the the nut bolts or some seat covers or back mirrors or window shields these all can be uh, given through msmes a micro small or medium enterprise which will help in promoting the bigger businesses often say for example automobile industry then msmes also support product development that is they also help in designing innovation intervention and packaging of elements for a business or an industry msmes also help to support in the upgradation of technology infrastructure and modernization of a particular sector see uh, any business which is established say uh, in any of the eras or years after a certain point of time the market demand changes okay so say a business or a company which was established about 20 years ago maybe for a, a scooter or a, any other automobile or any other industry after a point of time it has to innovate it has to upgrade itself so there is a demand for new designing for a demand for new innovation in that particular sector so any um, msme startup can also give ideas to these big businesses so this also becomes a small enterprise which is of a consultancy nature or it is providing some out ideas to the to uh, upgrade the business to make it in tune with the current needs the present demands the demands of the youth of today so such msmes are also important which can support the upgradation of technology infrastructure and modernization of a 
particular sector. Then MSMEs also provide employment opportunities, as we all know, not only for one own self, but also for others. It also helps in imparting loans. MSMEs can provide credit limits for funding and support to various banks also in the country. That is what it has been doing in other countries as well. Now, what is the role of MSME in our country? That is as per the Indian economy. MSME sector has proven to be highly dynamic factor in the forecasting of Indian economy. They have played an essential role in providing employment opportunities in the underprivileged areas. They have helped in industrialization of areas with low capital cost compared to the larger industries in bigger towns or cities. Since MSMEs produce and manufacture a variety of products for both domestic as well as international market, they have helped to promote the growth and development of product segments and industries both. MSMEs, that is the micro, small and medium enterprises, they are very important employers of people and a huge amount of countries GDP is also generated by the MSMEs. In some countries, up to 97% of the population is engaged or employed because of MSMEs itself. And the Indian MSME sector contributes 29% towards the GDP through its national and international trade. Thus, governments of every country should provide as much support to MSMEs as possible. And in India, there is approximately there are approximately 6.3 crore MSMEs. And as per the MSME ministry data, uh, that is as per the data of 2021 May 16, there are about 30 lakh MSME sectors registered in our country. And out of these 30 lakh, 93% belong to the micro sector while 6% belong to the smaller sector and only there is only 1% which is coming under the medium sector that is only 24,000 enterprises. Now if we have to say that uh, why there is the maximum amount of percentage which belongs to the micro that is because of the investment uh, part because for any micro level enterprise only um, less than 1 crores of investment is required and a turnover of less than 5 crores is uh, accounted for. So if there is any micro enterprise then it, uh, it requires less than 1 crore of investment and if the, there is a uh, say there is an enterprise in which there is turnover of 50 crores or less than 50 crores, then we say that that enterprise comes, comes in the smaller sector. And here the investment which would be required would be less than 10 crores. Similarly, for a medium, which is only 1% in our country, less than 250 crores of uh, turnover and less than 50 crores of investment is required. So you can understand that if we have lesser funds, then naturally we can have a micro level enterprise. Now government of India has initiated various schemes on this entrepreneurship like Startup India, Incubation, Aspire which is a scheme on promotion of innovation in rural industries and entrepreneurship and Coir Industry Technology Upgradation Schemes. MSMEs are also being encouraged to market their products on the e-commerce website which is specially through the government e-market platform owned and run by the government where from ministries and public sector undertakings source their procurement. Now coming back to the program which we are doing in IGNU and offering from IGNU that is the School of Vocational Education and Training at Indira Gandhi National Open University is offering a program BAV MSME that is Bachelor of Arts Vocational Studies in Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises. 
and the main objective of this program is to provide a complete know-how on establishing a new business venture while pursuing your graduation or BA degree. So, re recognizing the need of the country, recognizing the need of the hour, we have developed this program and this program will enable the learners to recognize the business opportunities by learning how to carry out the market study and how to plan and design a new business project or a new startup. So, who can take admission in this program? If you are 10 plus 2 pass out and if you uh, want to make your career as an entrepreneur and would like to update the existing knowledge and skills in the field of micro, small or medium enterprises, then you can join this program and any pass out of 10 plus 2 science, commerce, arts graduate Oh, sorry, arts pass out of 10 plus 2 can take admission with or without any ITI or vocational training. Those who want to set up uh, or start their own micro, small and medium enterprise, be it from home, may, may be from a home small business or, or a small business, then they can also uh, take admission in this program either for the manufacturing or the service sector as I have already explained. Now, those who want to join an established, uh, already established enterprise, they are also going to benefit. It is not only that you have to have a startup of your own, but the knowledge which we will provide will also benefit you when you take admission in this program and join some other business or any other enterprise. Let us have a look that what all are the objectives of this program. Main objective of the program is to impart knowledge, skills and competencies for initiating one's own business venture, to provide innovative and competency-based approach in the area of entrepreneurship and to help in generating employment opportunities for others as well. Then another objective is to inculcate managerial skills for successful and profitable operation of the enterprise, to educate in smooth functioning of the enterprise to enhance interpersonal skills and leadership skills and to build skills in communication, IT, operations and marketing which will all be important for running your own business. So let us now take a look about the details of this program and I would request my colleague Dr. Johari to please give you a brief about the program details. Um, thank you, Dr. Rachna, for sharing with our viewers some very useful information about the micro, small and uh, medium enterprise. And I'm sure they would be wanting to know what are the objectives of this program, what are the learning outcomes of this program. And very nicely you have, uh, you know, uh, told us about uh, what this uh, BAV MSME program is all about. Now, as far as the School of Vocational Education is concerned, now let me uh, start by giving you uh, some program details related to the program. First of all, uh, as uh, Dr. Rachna has already mentioned, the eligibility is 10 plus 2 pass outs with any discipline. The medium of instruction is English. The duration of the program is three years minimum. For any bachelor's degree program in IGNO, it is a three years minimum uh, duration and a maximum six years duration. That means you can complete your bachelor's degree in a maximum of three years time. Uh, the program has a total credit of 132 and the fee structure is uh, 5,100 rupees per year and the total fees for the program is 15,300 rupees. Now moving on to the... Uh, I think so the course structure, the distribution of the courses, you know. Uh, I think so this course comprises of, uh, you know, 12 core uh, courses. There are four discipline specific courses. There are two ability enhancement courses, four skill enhancement courses and two generic courses. Now, so we can say that there are 23 courses and one project which is being offered under the Bachelor of Vocational Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise program. Now, we know that as per NEP 2020, it has proposed a multidisciplinary uh, education system, uh, a holistic approach across all streams in order to ensure knowledge, integrity and harmony. So, as I just uh, uh, we saw in the slide that the distribution of courses, it is a multidisciplinary approach which combines knowledge and skills from several academic disciplines to address 
complex issues and difficulties so rather than studying each academic topic separately a multidisciplinary approach focuses on you know connecting them all together so this method is really very essential and necessary for any teaching learning process now if you uh, have a look at the course structure we have courses in english we have courses in humanities we have courses in language we have courses in commerce we have courses in environmental uh, sciences so students can acquire knowledge of science humanities language social science professional skills vocational skills ethics morals and human values all at the same time through the multidisciplinary and holistic learning method now uh, as i just mentioned that there are 23 courses which we are offering in this um, program and there is one project so i am sure the learners would be wanting to know about uh, you know about the courses now there are courses you know in english i said there are courses in commerce there are courses in environment there are courses in stress management there are courses in marketing there are courses in and in, in the entrepreneurial sectors so uh, just to tell our uh, viewers you know that each course it consists of four to five blocks and uh, each block will depend uh, depending on the number of credits for example if there is a course on uh, csr projects and programs if it is a six credit course it will be having five blocks five to six blocks and when we talk about a block it is a kind of a booklet which represents the main theme which is related to the particular course and further each of these blocks will be divided into four to five units or chapters which is again related to the particular theme for example when i just said we are talking about uh, the course on csr projects and programs we have thematic areas in that so uh, talking about the thematic areas thematic area uh, will be one of the blocks and under the thematic areas we will be having you know four to five units it will be on poverty evaluation it will be on uh, women empowerment it will be on livelihood it will be on uh, health sector so this is how you know the courses have been divided now talking about uh, the project the objectives of the project is to help the student you know develop the ability to apply their multidisciplinary concepts market research tools and techniques to establish one's own venture or to study a, uh, and detail out what is a, uh, existing in the uh, small uh, micro small and medium enterprise and uh, the project you know it can be in any of the following uh, types you know you can undertake the project in any of the following two ways it can be a comprehensive case study of any of the existing micro small or uh, medium uh, venture or it can be a field study you know a market research in a potential area which is of your own interest or for a new startup now uh, coming up to the evaluation methodology as we just mentioned that there are 23 courses so when we are talking about courses and uh, the weightage which is given to the continuous evalu evaluation that is assignment is 30% and the weightage which is given to term and examination which is held twice in the year uh, in the month of june and december uh, it is going to be 70% and as far as the project is concerned the weightage uh, for your um, i think so your um, assignment is 30% and for your term and examination theory is going to be 70% so um, i think so we have uh, shared with our learners you know uh, uh, most of the things and lastly talking about the delivery mechanism of course we have the uh, study material which is in the form of self learning material it is available both in the hard copy as well as in the soft copy format and we have uh, learner support services uh, which are being provided by ignu study centers all across the various regional centers uh, then there is an academic uh, counseling which is done at the study centers where we have a blended mode it can be through your uh, interactive radio counseling session it can be through your gyan darshan what we are having right now it can be through any virtual platform uh, it can be through zoom google and of course it can be through uh, offline mode Uh, where you can you know get in touch with your counselors at your respective study centers so i think so uh, dr rashna we have given uh, our learners a comprehensive um, uh, input yes. about the ba program if anything else you would like to add i would just like to encourage our uh, viewers that the uh, admissions are going on and you can um, uh, browse the uh, ignu website and you can go to the common prospectors and apply for the admission to a, to this program ba uh, vmsme and uh, for any assistance you can also contact us in the school of vocational education and training and uh, we would be very happy to help you 
so thank you viewers and i encourage you to please have a look in the program for the program and i would also encourage you to uh, develop your capabilities and your innovation skills and knowledge uh, by medium of this program thank you so much thank you current global economy and digital era learn or perish is the order of the day for all adults in all sectors of life as a result adult education and lifelong learning have assumed great significance igno as a national university has played its role by way of coming up with the master of arts in adult education program maae maae program focuses on different aspects of theory and practice policies and program as well as research among other things related to adult education mae is a two year modular program with multiple entry and exit options students who complete first year of the program will be awarded with the postgraduate diploma in adult education in case they want to continue they will complete the second year program and they will be awarded with the master of arts in adult education mae program consists of 10 courses five courses in each year eight theory courses six credits worth and one practical course of 10 credits in the first year and one dissertation course of 10 credits in the second year. practical course of maae is divided into three components namely community based practical activities workshop based practical activities and adult education training center or institution based practical activities and a student has to complete all the three components for completion of this practical course the minimum qualification required for admission to this program is bachelor's degree from any recognized university the minimum duration is 2 years and the maximum duration is 4 years instructional system follows multimedia approach the major medium of instruction is self learning print materials which is supplemented by other media such as audio video programs broadcasting that is interactive radio counseling teleconferencing personal contact programs or counseling sessions at the study centers workshops and field work as well as internship at the institutional level those who seek out a masters degree in adult education have a myriad of career and specialization options they can go further for higher studies that is research in various fields of adult education and adult literacy teacher faculty in university departments of adult and continuing education extension and lifelong learning field functionaries in the projects implemented by state and central governments as well as ngos for more details you can log on to www dot ignou dot ac dot in. Don't forget to take admission. Hurry up.
नमस्कार दर्शकों आज का जो विषय है सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ रूरल डेवलपमेंट ग्रामीण विकास का महत्व वो हमारे एम प्रोग्राम पीजीडीआरडी प्रोग्राम सीआरडी प्रोग्राम के एम आर टू जीरो वन कोर्स जिसका नाम है ग्रामीण विकास भारतीय संदर्भ रूरल डेवलपमेंट इंडियन कंटेक्स्ट उसका ब्लॉक सेकंड का पार्ट है सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ रूरल डेवलपमेंट ग्रामीण विकास को जब हम समझना चाहते हैं जब ग्रामीण विकास की जब हम बात करते हैं और भारतीय संदर्भ में जब उसको देखना चाहते हैं तो उसको महत्व को समझे बगैर हम उसको नहीं समझ सकते क्योंकि ग्रामीण विकास के महत्व के बाद ही उसकी हमें प्रत्यक्ष और एक पृष्ठभूमि समझ में आती है उसके अलग अलग आयाम हैं ग्रामीण विकास के महत्व में भी हम अलग अलग दृष्टि डाल सकते हैं जिसमें आर्थिक है सामाजिक है राजनीतिक है उसमें रूरल हेल्थ केयर की बात हम कर सकते हैं स्वास्थ्य देखभाल की बात कर सकते हैं महिलाओं की परिस्थिति और सामाजिक समानता असमानता सभी वर्गों का स्थान उन सब आयामों को हम देख सकते हैं और आज इस विषय पर चर्चा करने के लिए हमारे साथ ग्रामीण विकास विभाग से प्रोफेसर औरबिंदो महतो जी डॉक्टर बलकार सिंह जी और मैं बूटा सिंह आपके साथ चर्चा करने के लिए मौजूद हैं तो प्रोफेसर अरविंद महतो जी जैसे ग्रामीण विकास के महत्व को समझने के लिए हमें अलग अलग विषयों को देखना होगा अलग अलग आयामों को देखना होगा तो जिसमें हम बात करते हैं आर्थिक आयाम ग्रामीण विकास का जो आर्थिक विकास की दृष्टि को समझने के आधार पर क्या क्या महत्व है या आर्थिक विकास में ग्रामीण विकास का क्या महत्व है तो आप उस पर थोड़ा सा हमारे लर्नर्स को uh, if we see ki uh, rural development it's two kind of development uh, prospect available here do tarah ke isme hote hain farm based livelihood and non farm livelihood to mm-hmm. so farm based livelihood ka direct contribution to gdp it's very high if you see the indian contribution of agriculture in gdp still it's 18% ऑफ जीडीपी कंट्रीब्यूशन एंड दैट इज द मेजर पार्ट ऑफ रूरल डेवलपमेंट की एग्रीकल्चर फार्म बेस्ड लाइवलीहुड ऑन दिस पार्ट एंड अलोंग विद दिस नॉन फार्म लाइवलीहुड नॉन फार्म लाइवलीहुड जो है उसका भी एक बहुत बड़ा कंट्रीब्यूशन होता है फॉर द सेक्टर ऑफ डेवलपमेंट इन द टर्म्स ऑफ इकोनॉमी एजुकेशन सोशल सो आई वुड लाइक टू से इन क्रक्स देर इज ए फूड सेल्टर एंड cloth clothing mm-hmm. this three component fulfilling the rural development along with another two major component is fulfilling by the rural development that is employment and education mm-hmm. and which is ultimately contributing to the rural development sector now while contributing in terms of farm and non farm based livelihood option if you could see in major of major of the our residents of india in uh, population they are not in a organ they are not working in a organized sector mostly they are organizing in unorganized sector there is a huge mass labor force involved around 60% of labor force involved in the agriculture and allied activities and this labor forces need to be streamlined need to be strengthened in terms of technical know how in terms of other uh, livelihood opportunities so i think so this is the best uh, platform that uh, rural development can play a significant role in the terms of economic growth of a country and that is gdp of a country while producing the farm based livelihood and non non farm livelihood opportunities as well as entrepreneurship and other employment based skill enhancement through the rural development programs so uh, uh, another way if we would like to discuss uh, in these terms it can be says suppose uh, we are talking about the employment generation now rural development after studying or de- getting a degree on the rural development sector one way people are learning the skills skill sets are entrepreneurship development in the rural technology based entrepreneurship and those technologies are basically the environment friendly and we could we could say that those are nature friendly technology and when the people are using this nature friendly technologies for the employment activity or for their business or entrepreneurship activity then the country's gdp growth in a multiple facet 
Why? Because most of the developed country, if you could see, they have growth. Suppose America has a grown very uh, well. Uh, they have a developed the economic base. China has developed France, Italy. All most of the developed countries have de developed a, a huge economy base. But problem is there. They have lose their environment. They have they have more towards the industrial development, but they have never never consider for the environment. Now when they are thinking for last 10 to 20 years for the environment, the time has gone. It is very difficult for them to reverse the system and rebuild the environment and develop continuously. But Indian system, the rural development sector, if you could see, it has a inbuilt strength when the environment has taken in consider and the development is parallel to the equivalence to the rural economy, rural culture, rural society. So these are few uh, major significance of this uh, rural development programs. Gramin Vikas ke maitho mein aapne jo arthik ayam ko ke vikas, arthik ayam ko drashti di, jis mein aapne udhmita ka bataya, samvardhi ki baat ki, aapne ek tulatma ka dhyan karte hoi bataya, ki videsho mein kaise jo vikas, arthik adar pe vikas mein kaise us mein प्रकृति को उन्होंने छेड़ा है तो उससे कैसे हुआस हुआ है कैसे बेग गए और भारतीय दृष्टि से कैसे वो ग्रामीण विकास में आर्थिक दृष्टि से विकास हो रहा है और आर्थिक जिसमें जीडीपी सकल घरेलू उत्पादन है उसमें कैसे अलग-अलग ग्रामीण क्रियाकलापों के द्वारा जिसमें कृषि का भी आपने बताया और ग्रामीण उद्यमिता की बात भी आपने की तो ये एक तरीके से बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण विषय है अब इसके बाद में जब बात करते हैं भारतीय संदर्भ में तो एक विषय आता है गरीबी उन्मूलन पॉवर्टी एलिवेशन तो गरीबी उन्मूलन के विषय को समझे बगैर भी हम इसके महत्व को नहीं समझ सकते तो डॉक्टर बलकार सिंह जी गरीबी उन्मूलन के विषय के बारे में आप धन्यवाद बूटा जी आपने जो ग्रामीण विकास का महत्व है इसमें गरीबी उन्मूलन एक सबसे महत्वपूर्ण पॉइंट है यदि देखा जाए तो यदि भारत की बात करें और गांव की बात करें तो गरीबी सबसे ऊपर कर आता है तो इसलिए हमें देश के विकास की बात हो राष्ट्र विकास की बात हो किसी राज्य विकास की बात हो तो अनेक योजना कार्यक्रम गरीबी संबंधित चलाए जाते हैं क्योंकि भारत में ये देखा गया कि गरीबी के कारण जो कि ह्यूमन डेवलपमेंट है उसका अच्छी तरह से डेवलपमेंट नहीं हो पाता वे शिक्षा में रोजगार में खेलों में और अनेक तरीके से अपना योगदान देने में असमर्थ रहते हैं क्योंकि गरीबी मानव को इतना मजबूर कर देती है क्योंकि उसको रहने की अच्छी सुविधा नहीं होती खाने की नहीं होती उसको अच्छी शिक्षा नहीं मिल पाती रोजगार नहीं मिल पाता एक तरह से उसका जीवन पिछड़ों की तरह जीवन रहता है तो सरकार ने आजादी के बाद अनेक कार्यक्रम गरीबी उन्मूलन के लिए चलाए हैं परंतु विभिन्न कारण है उन कारणों से गरीबी को पूरी तरह से हम अपने देश से उन्मूलन नहीं कर सके समाप्त नहीं कर सके हालांकि समय समय पर अनेक कार्यक्रम सफल भी रहे हैं कुछ कार्यक्रम को रिवाइज भी किया गया है कुछ कार्यक्रम को मर्ज भी किया गया है यदि इस संदर्भ में आज के संदर्भ में बात देखें तो सबसे बड़े दो मेजर कार्यक्रम जो गरीबी उन्मूलन के चले हुए हैं मनरेगा महात्मा गांधी रोजगार गारंटी कार्यक्रम इसमें ग्रामीण लोगों को सौ दिन का गारंटी रोजगार मिलता है गांव के नजदीक क्षेत्र में मिट्टी की खुदाई हो तालाब की खुदाई हो सफाई हो पानी नलियों की सफाई हो कच्चे रास्तों मिट्टी बराई हो कह सकते हैं कि हाथ का कार्य होता है जिसमें कोई भी गांव का व्यक्ति सरपंच के पास और ग्राम सेवक के पास अपना आवेदन दे सकता है रोजगार के लिए और उसको शोधन का रोजगार हर पंचायत की जिम्मेदारी उपलब्ध करा जाए ताकि इस शोधन के रोजगार से वो जो मूलभूत आवश्यकताएं हैं पहले रोटी कपड़ा मकान को मानते थे परंतु आजकल शिक्षा और स्वास्थ्य भी इसके साथ जुड़े हुए हैं इस तरह का इसलिए इंटीग्रेटेड डेवलपमेंट के लिए उसको शोधन का रोजगार कम से कम चाहिए ताकि वो जीवन की आधारभूत सुविधा प्राप्त कर सके इसके अलावा सरकार का एक बहुत महत्वपूर्ण जो कार्यक्रम है राष्ट्रीय बहुत महत्वपूर्ण नेशनल लाइवलीहुड मिशन आजीविका राष्ट्रीय आजीविका मिशन जो कि पूरे देश में महिलाओं के माध्यम से चला जाता है जिसमें इस कार्यक्रम में महिलाओं का एक ग्रुप बनाकर उनके द्वारा कोई न कोई मैंने किसी तरह की जो उत्पादन की इकाइया पैदा की जाती है जिसे रॉ मेटेरियल से कुछ उत्पाद पैदा करें और उस उत्पाद को मार्केट तक जाए आम लोगों तक जाए शहरों तक जाए ताकि उस उत्पादन को खरीदने से उनको रोजगार बढ़े 
और स्थानीय जो रॉ मेटल है उसका सही तरीके से उपयोग हो उसके ताकि वो गरीबी उन के साथ साथ स्वरोजगार की बढ़ावा मिले और महिलाओं का आर्थिक विकास हो क्योंकि समाज की दृष्टि से देखा जाए जो गरीबी का प्रभाव सबसे ज्यादा महिलाओं पर पड़ता है क्योंकि महिलाओं को हर रोज शाम को रसोई में भोजन बनाने के लिए कुछ चाहिए उसके चाहिए उसके लिए पैसे की जरूरत होती है जब महिला के पास कुछ पैसे नहीं हो गए तो रसोई का कार्य वह पूर्ण तरीके से नहीं कर सकेगी और बच्चों को समस्त भोजन नहीं दे सकेगी इसलिए गरीबी उन्मोदन के लिए महिलाओं को सशक्त करना महिलाओं को स्वरोजगार देना उनको आर्थिक रूप से सफल बनाना बहुत जरूरी है और ये जो राष्ट्रीय आजीविका मिशन कार्यक्रम है ये कह सकते हैं कि महिलाओं के जीवन में मील का पत्र साबित होगा और गरीबी उन्मूलन में कार्यक्रम देश के लिए बहुत बड़ा कार्यक्रम है तो उम्मीद कर सकते हैं कि इन दोनों कार्यक्रम से हालांकि इसके अलावा छोटे छोटे कार्यक्रम है जैसे महिलाओं को कृषि क्षेत्र में ऋण दिया जाता है घरेलू काम करने के लिए बैंक से लोन दिया जाता है और अनेक तरह के प्रशिक्षण दिए जाते हैं राष्ट्रीय ग्रामीण स्वरोजगार संस्थान से पंद्रह दिन के एक महीने के छोटे छोटे कोर्स होते हैं मेहंदी रचाव है ब्यूटी सेंटर है सिलाई कढ़ाई का प्रशिक्षण है अनेक तरह के कार्यक्रम चलाए जाते हैं परंतु यदि देखा जाए तो गरीबी उन्मूलन देश के ग्रामीण विकास के साथ चौधरी दामन का साथ है यदि ये गरीबी उन्मूलन हो जाता है तो गाँव का विकास हम कह सकते हैं कि एक समग्र विकास या राष्ट्र का विकास संभव हो सकता है इस प्रकार हम कह सकते हैं गरीबी जो उन्मूलन कार्यक्रम है उसमें ग्रामीण विकास की पढ़ाई में इसका बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण योगदान है क्योंकि बहुत सी योजनाएं ग्रामीण विकास की पढ़ाई के दौरान बताई जाती है और उन योजनाओं के माध्यम से कोई भी व्यक्ति रोजगार स्वरोजगार के माध्यम से इसमें अपनी भूमिका निभा सकता है समाज के वंचित लोगों का साथ दे सकता है और उन्होंने सही रास्ता दिखाकर गरीबी उन्मूलन कार्यक्रम में अपनी भूमिका अदा कर सकता है अपना योगदान दे सकता है ठीक आपने गरीबी उन्मूलन कार्य उन्मूलन के लिए जो ग्रामीण विकास कार्यक्रमों का जो लक्ष्य सुधार है उसकी तरफ आपने एक दृष्टि दी और ग्रामीण विकास कार्यक्रमों के द्वारा जो भारत में जो गरीबी उन्मूलन के लिए कार्यक्रम चलाए जा रहे हैं उनको बताया इसके साथ साथ जो ढांचागत विकास है और संरचनात्मक विकास है और आर्थिक और सामाजिक दृष्टि से भी उसमें आपस में एक तदम में एक हम ये कह सकते हैं कि समावेशी दृष्टि आपने दी अब इसके बाद में आता है कृषि उन्नति एग्रीकल्चरल एडवांसमेंट है ये भी ग्रामीण विकास के महत्व को समझने के लिए बहुत आवश्यक है क्योंकि हम जानते हैं कि जो कृषि है एग्रीकल्चर है वो कहीं ना कहीं जो ग्रामीण आर्थिक व्यवस्था का आधार है ग्रामीण अर्थव्यवस्था का आधार है तो कृषि की जो उन्नति है एग्रीकल्चरल एडवांसमेंट उसको समझे बगैर उसको नहीं समझ सकते तो एग्रीकल्चरल एडवांसमेंट के बारे में भी बताइए जैसा आ, मैं पहले ही बात कर रहा था कि देर इज एग्रीकल्चर इज द वन ऑफ द इम्पोर्टेंट सेक्टर की फॉर द रूरल डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द सोसाइटी इस सेक्टर में अगर थोड़ा डीपली नजर दे तो हम देखेंगे कि हमारे देश का करीब सिक्सटी आबादी दो हजार इन्वॉल्व इन एग्रीकल्चर स्टिल जीडीपी कंट्रीब्यूशन इज ओनली 18 परसेंट तो हमारा 60 परसेंट आबादी इसमें इन्वॉल्व है हमारा मेजर लैंड रिसोर्सेस आर इन्वॉल्व इन एग्रीकल्चर लेकिन आउटपुट थोड़ा अभी भी स्टिल इट्स फॉर एवे टू रीच तो एग्रीकल्चर एडवांसमेंट का जो पीक होता है और जिसको हम कहते हैं कि दैट इज द एक्सट्रीम पॉइंट ऑफ एडवांसमेंट स्टिल हैव टू रीच एंड स्टिल फॉर एवे टू गो टू द एग्रीकल्चर एडवांसमेंट and then for agriculture advancement there is basic things we need to understand first if we see the how to treat the seed treatment if seed has been treated properly if the soil health card is available with us if seed and soil health card both are uh, matching to each other the soil nutrients available uh, are sufficient for the seed which we are planting then the productivity can enhance that is the first and foremost thing so most of the farming sector people are involved in our country lacking in that part so technology advancement in terms of train them how to treat the seed and the various seeds have a various process of treatment so what treatment procedure applicable for each seed that is also important that has to be understood 
and then second the soil health cut as i said and now you will be happy to know that government of india has starting a project where the school students can provide a soil health card to the farmer so suppose a matriculation student or higher secondary student the small labs are available in the rural area and the small schools also in that lab is itself the soil testing components are supplied and instructed by ministry of education by that every lab should be able to equipped with such kind of facilities so uh, in such a way we can say that technology at the grassroot level can reach in a very faster way through our higher secondary or secondary level schools where we can provide the how to how how the health of your soil and what are the <coughs> nutrient is required and what are the fertilizer or what are the additional component you have to add in your soil and the second things if we consider the after the cultivation and uh, after the seed and soil is over now comes under how to uh, clean the weed weed management is the another component the the weed management technology is also very useful if you are using the chemical fertilizer that can also damage your bacteria which is very useful bacterias for the germination of the seed of the germina of the health of the soil so we have to be very technical enough or technically very sound uh, at the grassroots level that what kind of uh, technology we are using for the weed management pesticides fertilizer using that component and what are the balance of that if you could say uh, people will use the in a bulk npk nitrogen potash phosphorus uh, they use but npk if you see that is there what quantity is required in your soil that has to be tested first and then farmer has to be trained on that so technological advancement and nowadays uh, there are many agriculture farm suppose just uh, we are talking about the varieties of mango there is a amropali variety there is a orunika variety now this kind of mangoes has been developed in the lab of our agriculture in india itself Uh, various institution now this institution has developed this kind of technology where the a plant can give a crop in 2 to 3 years itself there is no need of 10 to 15 years or 20 years wait after planting so such kind of crop we know the sri variety of rice rice where it can produce a bulk number of bulk quantity of rice through the technology intervention or through the seed proper germination and technology uh, using the proper technology for cultivating the rice cultivation so there are various technology which has already developed or developing now this is the time to it has to reach to the farmer level so they, their advancement can contribute to our gdp since uh, nowadays the measurement of your countries it depends on how much your economic output is contributing to gross domestic product now if it is 18% if you see the america's gdp contribution there are 4% only they contribute from the agriculture very less but you will be surprised to know that only 2% people of america involved in agriculture and they are doubling the gdp contribution in the agriculture field so that means agriculture field has a potential if 60% <coughs> people are involved in our country at least it has to be contribution of gdp in the 60% or at least 40 30% so still it's a 80% 18% around so it has to be work on it on the terms of technology now if you could recall before 1962s before green revolution the country was suffering from the food what what the people were not able to get the minimum quantity of food <clears throat> to survive themselves then the green revolution came and the country's whole productivity dimension has changed and this is called basically the agriculture advancement so after that we got another the white revolution but still there is a another green revolution is needed to boost to implement this technology to actual terms of doubling the income of a farmer it's it's not a only the political statement or it's a only the vague statement it technically there is a scope of tripling the income of a farmer because uh, if you could see the developed countries they are they are giving that's why 2% of people are only contributing 4% of their gdp through the agriculture or farming 
so india has that potential and for that there is a technology is the only component which is still need to do much more thing for the development of the agriculture sector and enhance the productivity so it can lead the world and also feed the world in terms of food crop and the diversification which has india has in terms of crop production that can build the backbone of our countries through terms of economy as well as in health because we are talking about in the rural development that <coughs> technology doesn't mean that chemical fertilizer or pesticide these, those are harmful for our uh, uh, proper bacteria which is helpful for the soil that cannot be killed there is a so uh, vermi compost or another kind of uh, urine based some fertilizer neem cake neem pesticide bacillus thuringiensis such kind of organic uh, component of pesticide as well as fertilizers need to be incorporated and, and these are the process is going on and actually here is the factor of significance of rural development the people um through this course through the understanding the rural development people can learn how to implement such kind of technology for the betterment of the people so these are few words bahut hi suksham drishti rakhte hue aapne bataya ki jo takneek hai uska upyog karna hai advancement mein lekin usko bhi vivekpurn tarike se karna hai aur usme jo bhav hona chahiye wo manav kalyan ka hona chahiye usme jo chahe wo food ke liye ho chahe wo hame apni gdp mein growth karne ke liye ho usme bhi kahin kahin uska sakaratmak srajnatmak upyog hona chahiye srajnatmakta ki taraf hona chahiye na ki keval fertilizers pesticides use karke hum sirf production badhane ke liye ho aisa nahi ho usme manav kalyan ho kyunki insano ke upyog ke liye hai to uska bhav yahan pe dikhta hai और आपने बहुत ही कृषि विविधीकरण को बढ़ावा देने की बात भी आपने कही है अब इसमें अगली बात आती है वह ढांचागत विकास इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चरल डेवलपमेंट की बात भी हम कर सकते हैं कि जो ग्रामीण संरचना है उसमें जो ढांचा है उसके जो स्ट्रक्चर है उसमें कैसे विकास है उसके महत्व को भी समझना बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है डॉक्टर बलकार सिंह जी इसमें जी बूटा सिंह जी किसी भी राज्य का किसी भी गाँव का किसी भी क्षेत्र का विकास के लिए सबसे पहले ढांचागत विकास क्योंकि तो ढांचाओं का तो ही विकास हो सकता है ढांचे में क्या क्या चीज शामिल होती है सड़कें बिजली पानी जो आमतौर पर हर रोज लोग यूज करते हैं जैसे पहले बात करेंगे सड़क की यदि सड़क अच्छी होगी तो ट्रांसपोर्ट की व्यवस्था होगी तो गांव से जितने प्रोडक्शन है शहर तक तभी पहुंच पाएंगे जो इनमें दूध की आपूर्ति हो सब्जी की आपूर्ति हो भोजन की आपूर्ति हो या किसी तरह कच्चा माल की आपूर्ति हो इसके अलावा जो गांव के बच्चे शहर में पढ़ते हैं रोड सड़कें ठीक है तो समय पर सुगुल पहुंच पाएंगे अच्छे तरीके से घर पहुंच पाएंगे इसी तरह यदि कोई व्यक्ति शहर में रोजगार करता है दूसरे गांव में रोजगार करता है या किसी नजदीक कस्बे में रोजगार करता है यदि सड़कें अच्छी हैं तो समय पर अपना ड्यूटी पहुंच पाएगा और समय पर अपना उसका समय का उपयोग कर सकता है और अपना पूरा योगदान दे सकता है क्योंकि कनेक्टिव सड़क की कनेक्टिविटी एक ऐसी है जो कि गांव की जीवन रेखा बन गई है क्योंकि शहर और गांव का संबंध सिर्फ टेलीफोनिक नहीं है इनका जो आधारभूत संबंध है वो ट्रांसपोर्ट के माध्यम से है उसमें जो गांव की वस्तुएं शहर में जाएं और शहर से तैयार जो चीजें हैं बहुत सी चीजें हैं जो गांव के लोग यूज करते हैं वह किसी इंडस्ट्री में बनती है या किसी विशेष क्षेत्र में बनती है गाँव तक पहुंचती है वह गाँव के लोग यूज करते हैं तो एक तरह से दोनों तरह से कह सकते हैं कि शहर और गांव का जो जीवन का आदान प्रदान का संबंध है वो सड़क एक माध्यम है हालांकि रेल भी एक बहुत बड़ा माध्यम है परंतु छोटे छोटे क्षेत्र के लिए सड़कें बहुत जरूरी है क्योंकि रेल की पहुंच से छोटे एरिया तक नहीं हो सकती रेल ठीक है एक लंबी दूरी तक की यात्रा के लिए या मालगाड़ी के लिए या बड़ी जो ज्यादा प्रोडक्ट चीजें उनको पहुंचाने के लिए जरूरी है परंतु तो छोटी छोटी चीजें जैसे रोजमर्रा की चीजें लगा लीजिए सुगुन बच से जाते हैं या दूध की आपूर्ति सुबह सुबह सब्जी की आपूर्ति ताजे फल की आपूर्ति हम कह सकते हैं किसी भी शहर या गांव में रहने वाले की जो जीवन की शुरुआत दूध फल सब्जी किसी तरह से होती है और उसको शाम को जो सोने के समय पहले तक का भोजन होता है वो भी गाँव के रॉ मेटेरियल दूध सब्जी और इस तरह की चीजों से होता है तो कहने का मतलब यदि उसको सब्जी या फल समय पर पहुंच जाए उनको शहर के लोगों को नजदीक के लोगों को ताजा प्रोडक्शन मिले उनके स्वास्थ्य के लिए अच्छा है और गांव के लोगों को वेस्टेज ना जाए यदि कोई फार्मर है कृषि वाला है 
तो वो उसको उपज का सभी मूल्य सही मूल्य तभी मिल सकता है यदि उसका प्रोडक्शन सही समय पर शहर तक पहुंचे और उसकी ताजी आपूर्ति हो क्योंकि समय के साथ बहुत सी ऐसी सब्जियां फल है जो खराब हो जाते हैं और 50 परसेंट आप मान के चलिए कि सब्जी और फल का उत्पादन ट्रांसपोर्ट में या समय पर ना पहुंचने से या सुविधा न मिलने से या मार्केटिंग सही न होने से खराब हो जाता है तो कहने का मतलब जो एक किसान की आमदनी का जो जरिया है जो कि कृषि का दर्द कह सकते हैं वो ट्रांसपोर्ट सुविधा न होने कारण कहीं ना कहीं वंचित रह जाता है थोड़ा सा ब्रेक के बाद इस पर हम चर्चा जारी रखेंगे इसमें इसमें इस थोड़ा सा मैं ऐड करना चाहता हूँ इसमें सिर्फ सड़क और ये रोड नहीं है इसमें जैसे एक बताया कि सब्जी जैसे खराब हो जाती है तो कोल्ड स्टोरेज इज ऑल्सो वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट इम्पोर्टेंट एक कंपोनेंट होता है संरक्षण करने के लिए दूसरा था वाटर कंजर्वेशन वाटर कैसे प्रिजर्व करे ताकि यूटिलिटी बढ़े कैसे इलेक्ट्रिसिटी प्रोवाइड किया जाए ताकि वाटर पंपिंग से जो इरिगेशन है डीप इरिगेशन या स्प्रिंकलर इरिगेशन ये सारे चीज चल सके तो रोड के अलावा भी बहुत सारे और कंपोनेंट है इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर का जो हमें इस विषय में ऐड होना चाहिए मिलते हैं फिर ब्रेक के बाद The world's population has reached 8 billion on 15th November 2022, and we are still counting. I don't know where do we go from here. The predictions are scary. Any idea how many people can Mother Earth sustain? India's growing population is a serious concern, and we are soon going to become the world's most populous country. Wow, number one. Population is, after all, a human issue. The UN proposed Sustainable Development Goals cannot be achieved unless and until we consider the population dynamics. So here we are. Indira Gandhi National Open University offers appreciation course on population and sustainable development. The course explores the linkages between population and sustainable development. In this course there are diverse issues related to population environmental safety livelihoods human health migration urbanization and much more the course duration is 3 months but of course you can complete it within a year the eligibility of the course is graduation from a recognized university so if you are a development professional working in a government sector researcher or keen to know more about the population and sustainable development the course is must for you hurry up and join this course so that we are able to convert population into demographic dividend and not convert it into demographic disaster for more information visit www.igno.ac.in thank you आज की जो चर्चा चल रही है सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ रूरल डेवलपमेंट उसमें एक बार पुनः हम आपके साथ हैं तो जैसा कि हमने आर्थिक विकास ग्रामीण विकास के महत्व में आर्थिक विकास की बात की इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ की बात की गरीबी उन्मूलन की बात की कृषि उन्नति की बात की और ढांचागत विकास की बात की अब अगला और रोजगार सृजन की बात की और अगला जो विषय आता है वो आता है महिलाओं का सशक्तिकरण क्योंकि 
हम जानते हैं कि किसी भी समाज का दो पहलू होते हैं महिला और पुरुष उसमें दोनों ही बहुत महत्वपूर्ण पहलू है अगर एक पहलू कमजोर हो जाए या दो पहिए की बात कर सकते हैं एक पहिए अगर मजबूत हो दूसरा कमजोर हो तो वो उसमें साम्य नहीं बैठेगा उसमें एक संतुलन नहीं बैठेगा और जब संतुलन नहीं बैठेगा तो विकास की बात करना मुझे लगता है निरर्थक होगी तो इसलिए महिलाओं के सशक्तिकरण की महिलाओं की वीमेन एम्पावरमेंट की बात करना यहाँ पे बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है और भारतीय संदर्भ में ये बहुत ही विशेष हो जाता है तो इसके बारे में सूक्ष्म दृष्टि के लिए प्रोफेसर महतो जी महिला सशक्तिकरण पर प्रकाश डालेंगे वुमेन एम्पावरमेंट की अगर बात करें तो तीन मूलभूत चीजें हैं सोशल पोलिटिकल एंड कल्चरल सोशियो पोलिटिकल कल्चरल रूप से अगर एक महिला को एम्पावर किया जाए तभी वो आज के समाज के जो एक श्रेणी जो हमारे 50 परसेंट आबादी है महिलाएं इनको एक पैराल लेवल में लाया जा सकता है और सोशल में अगर देखेंगे सबसे इम्पॉर्टेंट और पहला कंपोनेंट आता है शिक्षा एजुकेशन इफ यू आर एबल टू provide a proper education system and current trends of education it's not like that uh, which we are talking about literacy increasing the literacy that is not going to solve the whole problem the education it terms of holistic education where the skill has to be incorporated with the education so skill based uska shiksha ho ek mahila ka empowerment ke liye aur us skill mein education ka aisa ek कॉम्बिनेशन बने जो थियोरिटिकल और प्रैक्टिकल नॉलेज दोनों बहुत गुरुत्व और महत्वपूर्ण हो अगर आप देखेंगे इस विषय में तो महिलाओं के पास स्किल इट्स ए काइंड ऑफ बॉर्न काइंड ऑफ कुकिंग ले लीजिए सेफ का रोल ले लीजिए बहुत सारे हाउस होल्ड एक्टिविटीज में एग्रीकल्चर फार्मिंग आज भी अगर खेत में आप देखेंगे धान रोपने का काम महिलाएं जितना अच्छा कर सकती है उतना अच्छा पुरुष नहीं कर सकते हैं इतना अच्छा गाय का सेवा जो होता है काउबेस इकोनॉमी का उन उसके अंदर गाय का जो सेवा करती है महिलाएं उतने अच्छे शायद पुरुष कर पाए कि नहीं संदेह है तो स्किल उसके अंदर पहले से है एंड नाउ दिस स्किल नीड टू बी एनहेंस थ्रू द थियोरिटिकल एजुकेशनल सिस्टम तो थियोरी और प्रैक्टिकल का कॉम्बिनेशन के साथ उसका एजुकेशन सिस्टम हो ताकि उसका सोशल अपलिपमेंट हो सोशल पेरीफेरी में और एक है उसकी फ्रीडम फ्रीडम इन टर्म्स ऑफ ड्यूटी फ्रीडम और ड्यूटी उसके पैरल चलता रहता है आजकल देखेंगे तो पूरा जो एक श्रेणी है अगर गांव की महिला का विचार करेंगे तो सारा जीवन वो अपना ड्यूटी ही निभाते रहती है लेकिन फ्रीडम का कॉम्बिनेशन सिर्फ अर्बन एरिया का कप ऑफ टी बन के रहना जाए इट्स ए कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ फ्रीडम और ड्यूटी ये दोनों चले अर्बन एरिया में भी जैसे ड्यूटी के साथ ही फ्रीडम का डिमांड हो ऐसे ही रूरल एरिया में ड्यूटी के साथ फ्रीडम का भी कॉम्बिनेशन बने एंड देन ओनली वी कैन से दैट वोमेन आर एम्पावर्ड इन टर्म्स ऑफ फ्रीडम एंड ड्यूटी बोथ इफ दे आर फुलफिलिंग देन द सोशल अपलिपमेंट होता है तो एजुकेशन हो गया ये हो गया दूसरे साथ दूसरे इसके साथ जो मेजर पहलू आता है वो हम बात करना चाहते हैं इकोनॉमिक ना इकोनॉमिक कंट्रीब्यूशन इज वेरी हाई ए वुमेन जो उसका डोमेस्टिक कंट्रीब्यूशन होता है दैट इज नॉट स्टिल काउंटेड आज भी हम बात करते हैं कि हमारे देश का जीडीपी शायद दूसरों से कम है ज्यादा है लेकिन इट इज द फैक्ट दैट इंडिया का बहुत सारा ऐसा जीडीपी है जो एक्चुअली जीडीपी में एंट्री नहीं हो पाती है शायद बहुत सारे अनऑर्गेनाइजेड सेक्टर है अब जैसे नॉर्थ ईस्ट की अगर बात करें वहां पे पूरा इकोनॉमी बैंबू बेस है और बैंबू से अगर किसी ने एक टोकड़ी बना लिया और टोकड़ी को मार्केट में जाके बेच दिया तो उसका जीडीपी में एंट्री प्रॉपर ढंग से कहा हो पाता है और आप देखेंगे कि वहां के अगर देखेंगे तो 90 परसेंट जो ग्रासरूट लेवल के महिलाएं हैं और वो जो बनाती है उनका हाउस होल्ड लेवल जो वर्क है आउटपुट स्वेटर बिन के अगर अपने हस्बैंड को पहना दिया अपने बच्चे को पहना दिया तो इट्स ए टर्म्स ऑफ जीडीपी लेकिन उसका जीडीपी में कोई एंट्री या उसका काउंटिंग हम नहीं कर पाते हैं तो हमारे अनऑर्गेनाइज सेक्टर की ये जो महिलाओं का इकोनॉमिक टर्म्स में कंट्रीब्यूशन है इसको काउंट करना और दूसरा जिसको हम काउंट कर रहे हैं विच इकोनॉमिक एक्टिविटीज आर काउंटेड अंडर जीडीपी उसमें महिलाओं की भागीदारी ज्यादा निभाना तो जैसे स्किल बेस इंडस्ट्री बेस वर्क हो गया बहुत सारे हाउस होल्ड बेस वर्क कल्चर हो गया जैसे पापड़ बनाना ऐसे बहुत सारे हैं जो प्रोडक्ट डायरी फार्म डायरी मिल्क अमूल का ऐसे बहुत सारे इंडस्ट्रीज हैं जहां पे महिलाओं का ह्यूज कंट्रीब्यूशन है और जीडीपी में उसका कंट्रीब्यूशन को काउंट प्रॉपरली करना और उसको जहां काउंट हो रहा है उसमें उसके भागीदारी निभाना और तीसरा पहलू जो हम बात करना चाह रहे हैं वो उसका है पॉलिटिकल एक महिला गांव में 
उसके चॉइस से वोट डालने लाइक ये जो डिसीजन होता है ये डिसीजन इट्स डेवलप फ्रॉम द चाइल्डहुड द पॉलिटिकल अवेयरनेस द सोशल अवेयरनेस तो एवरी हाउस होल्ड और एवरी फैमिली हैज ए ड्यूटी टू मेक और एम्पावर देअर गर्ल चाइल्ड अबाउट देयर ड्यूटीज एंड सोशल रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज एंड कौन सही है और कौन गलत है ये डिसीजन लेने का क्षमता उसके अंदर डेवलप हो और इसके चलते उसकी एक्सपोजर इकोनॉमिक टर्म्स पे उसकी एक्सपोजर उनका पढ़ाई एजुकेशन द इन बिल्ड हाउस होल्ड लेवल एजुकेशन एज वेल एज थियोरिटिकल और स्कूल बेस्ड एजुकेशन एज वेल एज सोसाइटल लर्निंग ऑपरचुनिटी वो होना चाहिए तीनों का कॉम्बिनेशन अगर होता है तभी एक लड़की बड़ी होके वो डिसीजन ले पाती है कि किसे वोट करना उसका सही बात है दूसरा बात आता है कि वोट में चुनाव तो जीत गए या पॉलिटिकल पार्टिसिपेशन से पंचायत प्रधान बन गया क्योंकि सीट रिजर्व था महिलाओं के लिए लेकिन सीट रिजर्व होने से सिर्फ नहीं वो महिला के अंदर वो डिसीजन एक पंचायत प्रधान की जो काम है या एक जो एमएलए का जो रोल है वो निभाने के लिए जो सारे स्किल्स और एटीट्यूड्स डेवलप होने हैं सोसाइटी के बारे में वो उसके अंदर बहुत आ, कम समय से बहुत छोटे उम्र से ही कहा जाए तो जब उसकी प्रारंभिक शिक्षा होती है तब से उसके अंदर डालने का प्रावधान हो ताकि हमारे शिक्षा व्यवस्था में भी हो स्कूल के प्लेटफॉर्म में वो अपॉर्चुनिटी हो और स्पोर्ट्स में पार्टिसिपेशन के द्वारा हो बहुत सारे यूथ पार्लियामेंट और ऐसे जो प्रतियोगिताएं चलते हैं उसमें उसके पार्टिसिपेशन हो तभी वो डिसीजन हो पाएंगे तो सोशल इकोनॉमिकल एंड पॉलिटिकल अगर तीन टर्म्स से उसका एम्पावरमेंट कर लेते हैं तो महिलाओं का एम्पावरमेंट कहा जाएगा लेकिन भारतीय संदर्भ में अगर देखा जाए तो एक चौथा पहलू है जिसको अगर हम लोग नहीं समझते हैं तो एक बहुत बड़ा रूट से डिस्कनेक्ट टाइप का चीज हो जाएगा वो है कल्चरल सो अगर जो भारतीय संस्कृति की जो कल्चर है एक माँ जो बच्चे के प्रति प्यार देती है और जिस कारण से आज हम इस यहाँ पे बैठ के आपके सामने बोल पा रहे हैं किसी माँ की ये भूमिका रही तो ये कल्चर जो भारतीय सोसाइटी की है कि अपने बच्चे के प्रति अपने पति के प्रति अपने इन लॉज सास ससुर के प्रति अपने पति सबके प्रति जो एक कल्चरल हेरिटेज के सबको संजोग के रखने वाला और कहिए तो फैमिली को एक सूत्र में बांध के रखने वाली जो है महिला उसकी ये कल्चरल डेवलपमेंट भी प्रॉपर तरीका से होना चाहिए ऐसा ना हो कि हम कल्चरल डेवलपमेंट छूट जाए और डेवलपमेंट के नाम पे हम रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज की तो पोलिटिकल अवेयरनेस की तो बात कर लें लेकिन हम अपनी रूट से जहां से कनेक्टेड है वो छूट जाए और माँ अपनी भूमिका से दूर ना हटे ऐसी एक शिक्षा व्यवस्था होना चाहिए तभी सही मायने में वोमेन एम्पावरमेंट की पहलू को पूरा किया जा सकता है जब हम इस चार पहलू को गौर और डीपली इन रूटेड अपने ये में कर सकते हैं सो दी सर जी बहुत ही बढ़िया तरीके से आपने बताया कि जो भारतीय संस्कृति है भारतीय संस्कृति में महिला सशक्तिकरण महत्वपूर्ण पहलू है और यहाँ पे जो महिला है यहाँ पे लेडी और लैंड का विषय नहीं है भारतीय संदर्भ भारतीय संदर्भ में मदर और मदरलैंड का संदर्भ है यहाँ पे माँ और मातृभूमि की बात की जाती है हमारी संस्कृति में तो इस भाव के साथ ये ग्रामीण जो संस्कृति है ग्रामीण जो समाज है उसमें महिला सशक्तिकरण के लिए अलग अलग प्रकार के कार्यक्रम भी चल रहे हैं उनके आधार पे भी हो रहा है शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में भी है जैसे सरकारी दृष्टि से देखे तो बेटी बचाओ बेटी पढ़ाओ का भी एक नारा काफी प्रसिद्ध है और राजनीतिक दृष्टि से भी साम्य स्थापित करने का प्रयास चल रहे हैं और आर्थिक दृष्टि से आप देख रहे हैं कि आज आर्थिक क्षेत्र में किसी भी आयाम पे महिला आप देखें ग्रामीण क्षेत्र से निकली हुई महिलाएं भी आपको देखने को मिलती हैं बहुत से उदाहरण हमारे पास हैं इससे हमें पता चलता है कि ग्रामीण परिदृश्य की महिलाएं भी सशक्तिकरण की ओर हैं अब जो अगला विषय आता है वो बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण है एजुकेशन और रूरल हेल्थ केयर क्योंकि शिक्षा और जो स्वास्थ्य देखभाल है उसको समझे बगैर भी हम इसके महत्व को नहीं समझ सकते क्योंकि ये एक इसके जो व्यवस्था है इसको बताता है इसकी स्थिति को बताता है तो इसके लिए शिक्षा और स्वास्थ्य देखभाल के लिए डॉक्टर बलकार सिंह जी थोड़ा सा हमारे लर्नर्स को विस्तार से बताएंगे बूटा जी पहले मनुष्य का सुखते हैं रोटी कपड़ा और मकान कहते थे परंतु पिछले पचास साल में रोटी कपड़ा और मकान के साथ साथ शिक्षा और स्वास्थ्य इसकी महत्वपूर्ण आवश्यकता बन गई है क्योंकि शिक्षा एक महत्वपूर्ण है जो आदमी को समग्र विकास करती है और उसको एक गुणवत्तापूर्ण जीवन की ओर लेके जाती है 
शिक्षा के माध्यम से हम देखो कितना चांद तक पहुंचे हैं कृषि में तकनीक आई है और कितनी एक तरह से मानव का जीवन एक तरह से एक दूसरे को जोड़ दिया गया है एक और शिक्षा ने इतनी प्रगति की है शिक्षा के माध्यम साइंस से आप देखोगे कि चिकित्सा क्षेत्र में लगाओ रोजगार के क्षेत्र में लगाओ कृषि क्षेत्र में लगाओ और अनेक ऐसे विषय है कि जिस शिक्षा ने सब कुछ जीवन को बदल दिया है और जीवन की गुणवत्ता आदमी की जीवन प्रत्याशा से लेकर और जीवन रहन सहन खान पान सोच विचार ये सब शिक्षा के माध्यम संभव है ये ग्रामीण क्षेत्र में शिक्षा की पहुंच बहुत जरूरी है क्योंकि गांव के लोगों का जो तो पिछड़ापन माना जाता है उस शिक्षा की वजह से ना है अनपढ़ शब्द सिर्फ गाँव के लिए प्रयोग होता रहा है कभी छोटे कस्बे और शहर के लिए प्रयोग नहीं होता रहा तो जो अनपढ़ का जो तगमा है एक तरह से भले कह सकते हैं गांव के लोगों लगाते हैं इसको शिक्षा के माध्यम से दूर किया जा सकता है हालांकि भारत में शिक्षा की जो प्रगति है काफी अच्छी है संतोषजनक है और आज की जो बात है कि जो जरूरत है तकनीकी शिक्षा और उच्च शिक्षा की गांव में आज भी ये समस्या है कि तकनीकी शिक्षा संस्थान की पहुंच गाँव तक नहीं है और जो चिकित्सा शिक्षा की बात है उसमें भी गाँव के लोग कहीं न कहीं पिछड़े है हालांकि इंटरनेट के माध्यम से जो आज की जनरेशन है आज के छात्र है वे नीट की परीक्षा हो या यूपीएससी की परीक्षा हो या विभिन्न प्रतियोगिता परीक्षा होती है उनकी तैयारी भी कर पाते हैं और रोजगार कहाँ मिल सकता है वो भी उससे भी लाभ लाभान्वित हो रहे हैं तो कैसे तो शिक्षा महत्वपूर्ण है और गांव के लिए यदि किसी क्षेत्र में वंचित है तो उसका कारण ये कि शहर से उसका दूर पड़ना या उसकी गरीब बियाड़े या फिर किसी न किसी तरह से परिवार के लोग बच्चे को दूर नहीं भेजना चाहते या वो या वो किसी न किसी तरह से बच्चा परिवारिक कामों में कृषि कामों में पशुपालन में सम्मिलित इसलिए बात से पिछड़ा हुआ है तो शिक्षा का बहुत बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण इसके साथ चिकित्सा स्वास्थ्य की बात करें क्योंकि स्वस्थ नहीं होगा स्वस्थ सोच नहीं होगी स्वस्थ सोच नहीं होगी तो कोई भी कह सकते है कि ए, अच्छा कार्य कह सकते हैं जिसको कि भविष्य की योजना के बारे में नहीं सोच सकता और जो स्वास्थ्य की बात करें स्वास्थ्य के साथ महिलाओं को जोड़ें क्योंकि महिला स्वस्थ बच्चे को जन्म देगी तो वही अच्छी सोच रखेगा राष्ट्र का निर्माण करेगा और देश के विकास में योगदान होगा तो आपको बताया चले कि संसार की चिकित्सा जो एक सिस्टम है भारत का सबसे बड़ा अच्छा पूरे संसार में विश्व में तो तो त्रिस्तरीय जो चिकित्सा का सिस्टम है जिला स्तर पर राज्य स्तर पर और ग्रामीण स्तर पर सबसे अच्छा ढांचा है क्योंकि जिला स्तर पर जिला स्तर पर अस्पताल होते हैं और स्थानीय स्तर पर प्राथमिक स्वास्थ्य केंद्र होते हैं जो कि स्वास्थ्य सुविधाएं प्रदान करते हैं तो आज भी जैसे कि स्वास्थ्य में जोड़ सबसे पहले महत्वपूर्ण जोड़ते हैं जच्चा बच्चा देखा जाए तो बहुत सी डिलीवरी संस्थागत नहीं हो पाती संस्था का मतलब हॉस्पिटल में नहीं हो पाती क्योंकि हॉस्पिटल में बच्चा यदि पैदा होता है उसके 99 परसेंट जीने के चांस होते हैं और यदि किसी कारण से वो हॉस्पिटल तक ना पहुंच पाता तो ये रहता है कि उसकी जो जीवन के रिस्क ही रहता है और किसी न किसी बीमारी से यदि बचपन में पीड़ित होता है तो पंगता जैसी समस्या होती है जैसे स्वास्थ्य के बारे में जैसे महिलाओं को प्रोटीन चाहिए विटामिन चाहिए और गर्भावस्था में बहुत उसको अच्छी जानकारी चाहिए उसको गर्भावस्था में क्या क्या चीज खानी चाहिए स्वस्थ बच्चा रह सके परिवार रह सके इस तरह से कह सकते हैं कि यदि ग्रामीण अक्षत्र का विकास है तो उसकी दूरी स्वास्थ्य है और यदि स्वास्थ्य के माध्यम से हम देश का विकास कर सकें तो सरकार को हमें सभी लोगों प्रयास करना होगा कि छोटी छोटी जो गाँव में भी आजकल छोटे छोटे क्षेत्र बन गए हैं लोग डाणियों में खेतों में रहते हैं वहां तक पहुंचो ताकि कोई भी माता कोई भी महिला स्वास्थ्य सुविधा से वंचित ना हो और हर आदमी को समय पर स्वास्थ्य सुविधाएं मिले जैसे लोगों की जागरूकता और सरकार के प्रयास से पोलियो उन्मूलन जैसी भी बीमारी देश से खत्म हो चुकी है क्योंकि पोलियो और चेचक जैसी जो बीमारी थी ये गांव में ज्यादा थी लोगों तक नहीं पहुंच पाई थी जागरूकता की कमी थी इस कारण से बहुत सी बीमारी भारत में सबसे ज्यादा इसके रोगी पाए जाते थे पर दो आधुनिक समय में देखा जाए तो स्वास्थ्य क्षेत्र में काफी प्रगति है लोगों में जागरूकता ही है और इसमें योग और मैं कहता हूँ आयुर्वेद का बड़ा महत्व है जो भारत की कह सकते हैं कि प्राचीन जो स्वस्थ रहने की पत्ति थी योग और आयुर्वेद था और धीरे धीरे बड़ी खुशी की बात है कि पश्चिमी देश भी 
आयुर्वेद को अपनाने लग रहे हैं और धीरे धीरे योग और आयुर्वेद की पत्थर की तरफ आ रहे हैं तो मैं लगता है कि यदि गांव को बचाना है गांव का विकास करना है तो थोड़ा सा हमें चिकित्सा सुविधाओं में आयुर्वेद को भी स्थान देना होगा योग को भी देना होगा और जो एलोपैथी है जो आपातकालीन सुविधाओं में सबसे जरूरी है उसको गांव स्तर पर बढ़ाना होगा ताकि गांव का अच्छी तरह से विकास हो सके इसका महत्वपूर्ण योगदान है बहुत ही बढ़िया बड़ी तरीके से बताया कि शिक्षा जो है वो एक विजन देती है एक दृष्टि देती है एक आत्मबोध की बात कराती है तो ग्रामीण क्षेत्रों में जो शिक्षा का ढांचा है ग्रामीण क्षेत्रों में जो विकास के लिए शिक्षा चाहिए उसमें अभी सुधार हो रहा है आप देख रहे हैं नई शिक्षा नीति भी आई है नई शिक्षा नीति में भी आप देखते देख रहे हैं कि स्थानीय भाषा में शिक्षा की बात की गई है उसमें समावेशी शिक्षा की बात की गई है तो वो भी कहीं ना कहीं एक हमें इसको समझने में सहयोग करती है अब जो स्वास्थ्य देखभाल की बात भी आपने बताई कि अलग अलग प्रकार के कार्यक्रमों के द्वारा जो रूरल हेल्थ केयर है उसमें डेवलपमेंट हो रहा है विकास हो रहा है और पहले जो कुछ कमियां थी वो आज आप देखते हैं कि गांव का जो कनेक्शन है वो शहरों से हो गया है और दूरस्थ स्थानों का कनेक्शन मेन स्ट्रीम से हो गया है तो उसमें सुधार हुआ है अब बात आती है पर्यावरण ये स्थिरता जिसको हम सस्टेनेबल एनवायरमेंटल सस्टेनेबिलिटी कहेंगे क्योंकि एनवायरमेंटल सस्टेनेबिलिटी को समझे बगैर भी हम ग्रामीण विकास को नहीं समझ सकते क्योंकि जो पर्यावरणीय एक संतुलन है पर्यावरणीय स्थिरता है उसको समझने समझना आज की जो वर्तमान परिस्थिति है उसके लिए बहुत आवश्यक हो गया है तो प्रोफेसर महतो जी इसके बारे में बताइए कैसे जो ये हमारा सस्टेनेबल रूरल डेवलपमेंट है उसमें कैसे ये जो पर्यावरणीय स्थिरता है या एनवायरमेंटल सस्टेनेबिलिटी कैसे सहयोग करती है इसके महत्व को बढ़ाती है इसमें तीन विषय है अगर एनवायरमेंट को देखे तो तीन विषय को बहुत जागरूकता के साथ अगर हमारे एग्रीकल्चर फील्ड में अगर एनवायरमेंटल सस्टेनेबिलिटी डेवलपमेंट के फील्ड में किया जाए एक तो है अप्रोचेस टू एग्रीकल्चर एग्रीकल्चर के जो अप्रोचेस है उसमें एक डायमेंशन चेंज आने का जरूरत है कि हमारे प्रकृति को कैसे प्रिजर्व करें जैसे हम बात कर रहे थे भर्मी कंपोस्ट ऑर्गेनिक कंपोस्टिंग ये ऑर्गेनिक कंपोस्टिंग तो हमें प्रोडक्टिविटी तो बढ़ाती है मिट्टी का क्षमता भी बढ़ाती है हमारे जो फ्रेंडली जो टर्म्स है फ्रेंडली टर्म्स इन द सॉइल में जो अवेलेबल है बैक्टीरिया उसको भी प्रोत्साहन देती है तो इस रूप से द एग्रीकल्चर का जो अप्रोच है उसे मुझे एनवायरमेंट ओरिएंटेड करना है दूसरा जो रिसोर्सेस है उसको मैनेज करना आज के दिन में हम देखेंगे कि पहले फ्लड इरिगेशन करते थे वाटर रिसोर्सेस सप्लाई करना है हमने पंप चलाया और पंप से पंप को पानी को बहाया लेकिन एक पौधे को अगर पानी में डुबा दिया जाए तो एक आदमी जैसे नाक उसके पानी के अंदर चला जाए तब तो वो सांस लेने में जैसा तकलीफ होता है जब हम फ्लड इरिगेशन करते हैं तो एक पौधे को भी सेम तरह का प्रॉब्लम होता है तो उसे प्रॉपर मात्रा में पानी का जरूरत है तो इसीलिए एक आवाज चली थी कि हम पौधे को तो पानी दे सकते हैं धरती को पूरा पानी नहीं देने लायक हमारे पास पानी का अवेलेबिलिटी नहीं है तो पौधे को पानी देना है ना कि पूरे जमीन को पानी देना है तो उसके लिए स्प्रिंकलर इरिगेशन डीप इरिगेशन दो तरह के हम लोग इरिगेशन इरिगेशन सिस्टम कर सकते हैं जिससे वाटर रिसोर्स का प्रॉपर तरीका से मैनेजमेंट हो अगर वाटर रिसोर्सेस हमने प्रॉपर तरीका से मैनेज कर लिया तो हमारी प्रोडक्टिविटी भी बढ़ेगी और हमारे नेक्स्ट जनरेशन हो चाहे हमारे नेक्स्ट क्रॉप के लिए पानी की फ्लो भी बची रहेगी अगर मिट्टी के अंदर से हम बोरिंग करके भी पानी निकाल रहे हैं तो पानी का क्वांटिटी हमें ऐसा ही यूज करना है इतना कम यूज करना है ताकि हमें जो पौधे को प्रॉपर पानी मिल जाए दूसरा डेवलपमेंट का पहलू है कि रिसोर्सेस को मैनेज करते समय जो हमने इंडस्ट्रीज बनाते हैं उसके जो वेस्टेज होता है वो वेस्टेज को हम किस तरह से मैनेज करते हैं इफ इट इज नॉट प्रॉपरली मैनेज द वेस्ट आज हम देखेंगे कि गंदा गंगा सफाई अभियान हो चाहे जमुना सफाई अभियान हो उसमें करोड़ों रुपया इन्वेस्ट किए जा रहे हैं लेकिन ये गंदे हुए क्यों क्योंकि हमने अपने वेस्ट को अपने जो डिस्पोजल्स थे हमको हमने अगर सही तरीके से इनको मैनेज कर लिए होते तो आज ये अभियान चलाने का जरूरत नहीं पड़ता आज भी अगर हरिद्वार जाएंगे या गंगोत्री जहां से गंगा की उत्पत्ति हुई पानी अभी भी साफ है तो 
आते आते इसको बहते बहते पानी गंदे करते गए और हमारा ही डिस्पोजल से ये गंदे होते गए तो वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट का बहुत सारे मॉडर्न तरीके आ गए हैं और जिससे हम अपने वेस्ट को मैनेज कर सकते हैं प्रॉपरली जैसे तो एक तो हमने बताया कि हाउस होल्ड लेवल में अगर वेस्टेज है तो उसको तीन कैटेगरी में डिवाइड करना रेड येलो एंड ग्रीन तो रेड हो गया जो नॉन डिस्पोजेबल है जिसको हम किसी तरह से डिस्पोज नहीं कर सकते हैं बैटरी हो गए बहुत हार्मफुल जो चीजें हैं उसको हम उसमें डालेंगे जो योलो है जिसको हम ऑर्गेनिक कंपोस्ट में या कंपोस्टिंग में कन्वर्ट कर सकते हैं थोड़ा टाइम लग सकता है या थोड़ा ट्रीटमेंट का जरूरत है ऐसे चीजों को उस डिस्पोजल में डालें और थर्ड जो ग्रीन है हमारे जो सब्जियों का छिलके ऑर्गेनिक वेजिटेबल्स का जो वेस्टेज निकलता है इसको अगर हम रखते हैं तो हम योलो और ग्रीन को बाद में योलो को तो कम्प्लीटली प्रोसेस के द्वारा कन्वर्ट किया जाएगा और ऑर्गेनिक डिस्कम्पोज को हम डायरेक्टली कहीं भी गड्ढे में डाल दीजिए नदीम कॉम्पोस्ट है वेरियस प्रोसेस ऑफ कॉम्पोस्टिंग है जिसके जरिए हम एग्रीकल्चर के क्रॉप में यूज कर सकते हैं लेकिन ऐसी चीज को अगर पानी में बह गया अगर हमारे ऑर्गेनिक कॉम्पोस्ट तो पानी को गंदा कर देगा और उसमें ऐसे ऐसे बैक्टीरिया स्पॉम होंगे जो हेल्थ के लिए बहुत हार्मफुल हो जाएगा तो डिस्पोजल अगर हम ठीक तरीका से मैनेज नहीं कर पाते हैं रिसोर्सेज को ठीक तरीका से मैनेज नहीं कर पाते हैं एग्रीकल्चर अप्रोच को अगर स्ट्रीमलाइन नहीं कर पाते हैं तो एनवायरमेंट को हम टिगर नहीं कर पाएंगे तो दिस इज द मूल इश्यू दूसरा मैं हेल्थ के विषय में बलकार जी बहुत अच्छी बातें बता रहे थी शिक्षा के बारे में भी बताए तो उस बारे में मैं थोड़ा सा ऐड करना चाहूंगा कि आज के समय में अगर देखेंगे बच्चे का स्वास्थ्य का मेजरमेंट होना हमारे पास मॉनिटरिंग सिस्टम का बहुत जरूरी है तो इसमें सबसे बड़ा आज के दिन में काम जो कर रहा है आईसीडीएस आंगनवाड़ी जो है वहां पे बच्चे का जो ग्रोथ चार्ट बनता है तो हर बच्चा वहां पहुंचे और उसमें ग्रोथ चार्ट बच्चे का ठीक है कि नहीं इसका मेजरमेंट होता रहे दैट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कि वो ग्रीन में आता है योलो में आता है रेड बैंड में आता है वो एक कार्ड देता है उसमें हाइट उसका जिस तरह से बढ़ रहा है तीन चीजें उसमें मेजरली लिए जाते हैं हाइट वेट एंड आर्म सर्कम्फेरेंस और हेड सर्कम्फेरेंस उसका हेड का चारों तरफ का सर्कम्फेरेंस ठीक है या नहीं आर्म का सर्कम्फेरेंस ठीक है कि नहीं वेट ठीक है कि नहीं एंड हाइट उसका प्रोपोर्शनेट ग्रोथ वाले रहे कि नहीं तो इसका मेजरमेंट जो है पहला पांच छह साल तक बहुत जरूरी है तो इसका मेजरमेंट हो उसके बाद हमने देखा है कि अभी आयुष्मान भारत के तहत जी। जो हेल्थ के ऊपर जो प्रोजेक्ट आए हैं आज जो हम गांव में अगर जाते हैं तो हेल्थ के ऊपर आयुष्मान भारत के थ्रू जो हॉस्पिटल या हेल्थ सेंटर्स प्राइमरी हेल्थ सेंटर जिसको हम कहते थे प्राइमरी हेल्थ सेंटर हो या सब हेल्थ सेंटर हो तो प्राइमरी हेल्थ सेंटर के कम से कम जाने का जो इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चरल डेवलपमेंट हुआ है वो काफी अच्छा हुआ है उसमें जो चीज अभी हमें काम करना है कि डॉक्टर्स अपने जीवन में मोटिवेटेड हो यहाँ पे पोस्टेड होने के लिए इस गांव में प्लेसमेंट होने के लिए उस चीज में हमें और काम करने हैं हमने इस इंश्योरेंस का प्रोसेस चालू किया हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस गवर्नमेंट के थ्रू बहुत कम पैसे में तीन सौ तीस रूपये में इंश्योरेंस का प्रोवाइड करते हैं इससे काफी लोगों को बेनिफिट मिल रहा है इंश्योरेंस के अलावा मतलब सरकारी तौर पे हम एक्चुअली हेल्थ सिस्टम का जो केयर सिस्टम है इसको <coughs> कवर अप नहीं कर पाते तो इसीलिए हमारे लिए ये बहुत जरूरी था कि इसको कवर अप किया जाए और इस सिस्टम को आगे बढ़ाया जाए तो और जी तो आपने बहुत ही विस्तृत दृष्टि से बताया कि पर्यावरण स्थिरता कैसे है इसके साथ साथ हम जो समावेशी विकास है उसकी भी बात कर सकते हैं कि जो ग्रामीण समाज है उसमें समावे इंक्लूसिव डेवलपमेंट जो है वो भी होना चाहिए इंक्लूसिव डेवलपमेंट में भी आप जी आ, हमारा समय शायद पूरा हो रहा है तो हम इसको थोड़ा ब्रीफ में समाप्त करते हैं कि एक हमारे ज, हमारे देश का अगर देखेंगे तो गाँव के स्तर में एक बहुत सारे कल्चर्स आपस में अलग अलग थोड़ा सा कल्चरली तो हम सेम है लेकिन डिवाइडेड है जैसे कहीं एससी है कहीं एसटी है कहीं ओबीसी के नाम से है दलित समाज के नाम से है तो हमारे जो डेवलपमेंट है ये रूरल डेवलपमेंट का प्रोसेस इस समावेशी होना चाहिए इंक्लूसिव डेवलपमेंट होना चाहिए जहां सोशल कोहेसिवनेस समाज का एक दूसरे के साथ जो डिपेंडेंट था हमारा समाज वो प्रथा को सामने ध्यान में रखते हुए समाज का एक दूसरे से उन्नयन होना है आज अगर सोचेंगे कि दलित समाज के बगैर हायर क्लास समाज का उन्नयन हो जाएगा तो वो पॉसिबल नहीं है तो दोनों का मिलके ही पूरे समाज का प्रगति हो सकता है तो शिक्षा का भी जैसे जरूरत है ऐसे हमारे बहुत सारे नीचे के साफ सफाई एग्रीकल्चर फार्मिंग आयरन मैन स्मिथ सारे का जरूरत है 
तो ये सारे वर्क को कॉम्बिनेशन करते हुए समाज में एक इंक्लूसिव डेवलपमेंट हो जैसे महिला ना छूट जाए दलित समाज ना छूट जाए ओबीसी कम्युनिटी ना छूट जाए जादव कम्युनिटी ना छूट जाए गुज्जर कम्युनिटी ना छूट जाए कोई भी कम्युनिटी हमारे से जैसे छूट ना जाए और सबको मिला के हमारा डेवलपमेंट और समाहित हो ये इंक्लूसिव डेवलपमेंट का एक प्रोसेस है और जो रूरल डेवलपमेंट में समाहित है तो आज का कार्यक्रम हम लोग यही समाप्त करते हैं सबको धन्यवाद श्रोताओं ने जिन्होंने ध्यान से सुना रूरल डेवलपमेंट का एडमिशन चल रहा है और हम लोग सीरीज के तौर पे सारे कोर्सेज को कवर कर रहे हैं जिन लोगों ने अभी तक एडमिशन नहीं लिया है जुलाई सेशन में एडमिशन ऑनलाइन जाके एडमिशन ले ले एम ए आर डी पीजीडीआरडी और सीआरडी कोर्स में सबको धन्यवाद and welcome to this special program i'm vipul mudgal and today we are talking about rural